Great. Well, uh, good morning and welcome. My name is David Shirk. I'm the director of the Trans Border Institute here at the Joan B. Kroc School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here for what I'm sure promises to be a very interesting discussion about Mexico's 2012 elections. Uh, Mexico hosted elections this summer uh, in, on July 1st in, uh, at the national level and in 18 different states throughout the country, uh, changing the overall panorama and political environment of Mexico from a 12-year period of rule uh, by the National Action Party to a predominantly uh, uh, pre or uh, part, uh, revolutionary institutional party government uh, at the federal, state, and local level, uh, effectively rolling back the political context of Mexico to one in which uh, uh, we saw, to one which we saw uh, 12, over 12 years ago, and for 71 years, in which there was single party dominance throughout the political system. How dominant? The PRI really is uh, in the political system, is arguably subject to some debate, uh, particularly when we look at uh, what we can expect from the current legislature, um, and as well uh, some of the key political strongholds at the subnational level, which remain in the hands of uh, the leftist uh, party of the Democratic Revolution and the National Action Party. Uh, but all of this will be subject the subject of today's discussion. We have with us for uh, a roundtable format discussion three very distinguished experts on Mexican politics and U.S.-Mexico relations, uh, starting with Federico Estevez uh, from the Political Science Department at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, the Technological Autonomous Institute of Mexico. Uh, also, uh, we're joined by our very own Emily Edmonds Polly, a professor of political science here at the university, um, as well as Jeff Weldon, who is also a professor of political science at the ITAM, the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México. Um, there are uh, few people who know these issues better than the group that we've assembled here today. Uh, these are many of the leading voices and experts on uh, Mexican politics uh, and will, I think, have very useful insights for us in thinking about both what happened in the 2012 elections and um, what the implications are, both domestically in Mexico in terms of uh, the national political scene, the policy issues that Mexico confronts today, and Mexico's very important relationship uh, internationally with the United States. Um, so we will, with no further ado, begin the program. The format, as I said, is a roundtable discussion. We'll be having relatively short presentations from each of the three main panelists. Um, we'll start with Federico Estevez, we'll go to Jeff Weldon, and then uh, we'll move to Emily Edmonds in a sequence of three sessions in which um, there'll be these short presentations, there'll be open discussion, Q&A, uh, thoughts from other members of the round table, uh, and then we'll move on to the, the next session. We'll take very, very short five-minute breaks in between. You are, of course, welcome to uh, come and go if you need to uh, get more coffee, use the restroom, et cetera. Um, but with no further ado, I will welcome Federico Estevez. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Uh, and it's nice to be back in San Diego, but it's a bit muggy, as I recall, for this time of the year. Um, um, and, um, and I need to apologize right off the bat for, you know, for being a uh, chinsily poetic uh, on, on, on the title. Uh, there, there were a lot of vanities exposed in, in, this, uh, in the run-up to uh, July's elections um, in terms of expected outcomes especially and also in terms of image politics or campaigning, so I want to talk about those vanities a bit um, and then move on quickly to what I think the election really established, which are a set of um, very strong and obvious continuities, uh, things that we've seen in Mexico since, uh, well, since at least the watershed elections of 1988, um, and that don't seem to be changing, uh, and that will have a major impact on uh, the kinds of policy uh, decisions that uh, that I suspect we'll, uh, we'll be seeing over the next six years, although I won't concentrate on that. I'm going to concentrate on the elections, and I think Jeff will, will take the, uh, the other part. 
If we can go to the first slide, I'll start with the, the biggest vanity, um, which was the was really the polling industry uh, in Mexico. Now, uh, for those of you who remember, say, the uh, 96 elections here, uh, Cl Clinton against, uh, ah, thank you. Uh, which one is it? This one? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. Uh, the 96 elections, uh, Clinton's re-election, uh, versus uh, uh, against Dole at that time, uh, something similar happened, which is that the polls inflated uh, the uh, the winning uh, uh, margin uh, for Clinton by at least by, by about double what he ended up getting. That's pretty similar to what just occurred. It was uh, uh, in uh, in Mexico, and uh, the critical part I think is uh, uh, here. You can see the where where uh, Peña Nieto, who wins with about 38% of the vote overall, having, with everyone expecting him to get about, you know, above 40, certainly close to 45 in most polling. Uh, what you see is just a very large inflation, a very large bias in the polling uh, in favor of, uh, of Peña Nieto, and since a very early stage. Uh, the dividing lines here are this is the PAN's primary in February uh, from which Josefina Vasquez Mota was elected as the standard bearer for her party, for the ruling party, that or the governing party. This was the first debate, the presidential debate, um, with uh, some shifts in opinion as a result, uh, especially the rise of López Obrador uh, on the back of that debate uh, and uh, the stabilization of, uh, in third place of uh, Vasquez Mota for the PAN. Uh, and a slide, uh, just a slim slide, according to the polling, for Peña Nieto, but you still had an expectation of about a 15-point margin at the end of the day with the last uh, pre-electoral surveys, uh, and it ended up being six points, no, or, you know, within a fraction. So uh, what did this mean for the campaign? Well, it meant an awful lot, as you can imagine. As it had in 96 here in the United States, uh, it, this had a something of a chilling effect uh, on the campaign, which is on the campaigns, meaning that since everyone believed uh, there was no reason to suspect that uh, um, Peña Nieto wasn't way ahead, a certain winner, um, well, this affected the kinds of strategies that the other candidates used. So, for example, uh, López Obrador coming into the second debate, uh, he probably was really within, certainly within single digits at that time of, uh, of Peña Nieto, uh, well, felt he had to, for example, take a very uh, uh, smooth, uh, conciliatory, uh, non-radical, very moderate uh, line in the debate, which he did. Uh, and of course, he was promptly pounded on by, you know, by his uh, opponents and later in, in the week's coverage after the debate. Uh, and he may not have been able to stretch. It looks like a campaign mistake, ex post, uh, a strategy uh, error, uh, a large one in terms of how to how to to um, to gain even more momentum that he already had going in his favor. But uh, in any case, it, it seems to have leveled off at that point. Um, but that was largely due to the fact that he thought he had to appeal to people that really expected him to be a decent guy instead of this fiery apostle no, of uh, reform and social and economic denunciation, which is what he's been for years and what everyone would expect him to remain being. Um, but in any case, it had a chilling effect. And of course, for, uh, for the other, uh, well, for Vasquez Mota and for and the fourth party candidate, the, the Teachers Union Party, uh, Mr. Quadri, uh, nothing much changed after that. The poll, this is a serious problem with the polling. I just want to interject this because after all, if, uh, if what we're seeing you know, on, his, on their historical record, this is the worst federal election we've ever seen in the polling industry in Mexico since, we got, since we've had polling uh, in media, and that's 94, the 94 presidential election on. Um, this is their worst performance uh, as, a, uh, as a group, as a guild, uh, but it's also, uh, it's just way beyond uh, the, the levels that you would expect. It's worse, for example, than the errors or the bias in 94 or in 2000 when they would routinely, you know, get them get them wrong, either even get the placement wrong in candidates. Um, this is, uh, and if you compare it to the U.S., um, we know that uh, there's, a, say, a standard uh, margin error of about two and a half 
for the ind for the polling industry in the U.S. since the 90s. Uh, well, it was over seven points in this one, uh, so it's three times as bad. And we're talking about the presidential race, which is the easiest one to forecast. Okay, I mean, uh, you know, the bigger the election uh, for, for a single uh, uh, candidate, for a single place, or, or um, Nom, um, uh, seat to be awarded, the easier to uh, to actually get it right. So it's really outrageous. If we go back to their historical record of the polling industry, the individual poll uh, firms, what we find is that um, is that they're you know they're partisan bias ex post, what we call or house effects, whatever, however you want, you know, you, we can be decent about it. Their house effects uh, only account for um, maybe 40 to 50 percent of the bias or the the compounded error uh, from uh, the election, uh, from their election polling this year. So something big needs to be explained. And it's a terrible thing if, you're, if you're pol your main pollsters, they're very prestigious, most of them, they've been around for 20 years. It's not, you know, they're not, they're not novices. Um, the problem with it, of course, is that, uh, well, you know, if, let's say you were interested in, I don't know, uh, presidential approval. Are you interested in whether the country is, uh, is in agreement with uh, um, the uh, anti-crime and anti-drug strategy or not? Well, how do you know? Um, you, by looking at the polling, you won't find out if this is the kind of bias that is typical of them at this stage in the game. You, you're going to be dealing with very inflated numbers one way or the other, uh, and we don't know which way. And since they have no explanation, or they've given us none, most of the pollsters for why uh, this occurred, uh, why their error ex post is so large, uh, there's, it's going to be very difficult to trust them for anything down the line, although there are a few pollsters that got it right. Um, uh, which, let's use it this one, yeah. Um, so one of the things we can look at is uh, reform, since they got it right. Uh, they were the, uh, you know, just looking back for a second, uh, Reforma is in this band of, um, of pollsters, no, for Peña Nieto. So they're, they're basically right. They were very close to getting it. Uh, so uh, on that basis, I'm going to say I trust their general polling, even on other opinion matters, uh, such as the approval ratings for the Calderon administration. Part of the... Um, Part of the problem, I mean, this is all from reform, and it's just their blocks of questions in their in their uh, quarterly now. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I think every four months now, uh, but their you know their series of national polls on uh, on approval. Um, of course, presidential approval. The black line up here is way, very inflated in Mexico. Uh, it's not like it's not what you have here in the U.S., where it, which is tied, where it's tied pretty well to economic uh, assessments uh, of the uh, of citizens. Uh, in Mexico, it seems I think it reflects strong deference to authority. Uh, it's just way too high for where it should be. So it's something else. But you know, the average uh, has him just barely above zero. You see, there's something of a since the election, which is right here. There's a little bit of a negative uh, snowball here. No, you know they're they're beginning to abandon. But in the run-up to the uh, to the election, things were getting better for them. But the overall average in the economy and in law and order was really the the net uh, approval was close to zero, meaning that you know there was no, nothing great going on. Looking looking a little bit like Obama, if you like, uh, for now. But the um, but in other words, there was but there also wasn't much. Uh, that the Calderon government was handing over in terms of political credit to its candidate. Uh, so she was, she was really rowing against the tide here uh, uh, for most of the campaign, despite better numbers for the Calderon government. Uh, and of course now, for those interested in the law and order issue, well, uh, uh, things seem to be going back to normal. I mean, where, you know, he has, he, he's, there's net disapproval and it's growing strongly uh, right now at the end of the, at the end of the sexenio in these last months, according to the very latest poll, which was just published a week ago. So, um, so in general, the, the PAN had not much to look forward to. It lost five points on the midterm elections, um, from, uh, is the 2009 elections. Uh, and that probably should be attributed to the campaign. There were it was an error-strewn, gaff-prone campaign by Vasquez Mota, especially in the first months. Uh, also, the party was extraordinarily divided. It continues to be so uh, between the presidential and non-presidential factions within, and uh, and they didn't help her much. Uh, there wasn't uh, not only was there not great coordination in the uh, you know in the races down the line. 
uh, across the uh, the spectrum, but there, and across the country, nor, there was also very little money. Um, the, the going word is that the government itself didn't give her much. So, uh, so that's a, a small problem that she faced. It made it much easier for Peña Nieto, who ran an extraordinarily smooth campaign, uh, very few errors really uh, in strategy, and uh, better than expected, at least for me, uh, reactive capacity to to bad events, say the uh, you know the student movement exploding on him at at the uh, Iberoamericana University uh, uh, halfway through the campaign, they reacted very well to this and and got over it, got o got over all the humps. Of course, they had all the money in the world, but they also ran a good campaign uh, compared to their opponents. So uh, on, on that end, you have a, you really have a um, a uh, I think. Uh, an imbalance, of course, in the campaigning. That hasn't mattered much in the past, but, well, it helps to, you know, the better your candidate in performance, the better your, the better it's going to go for you. Um, nothing else really needs uh, really uh, much saying here. It's just that we, have a la we had a lackluster presidency uh, that at least recovered from the worst of it, which was, were the, the really... Uh, rotten uh, periods of rising crime, of, of body count uh, uh, in new parts of the country um, uh, through the midway through the sexenio, and also, of course, the crack, the, the world economic crack that affected us in 2009 over here um, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in a in a very, um, well, the technocrats were, gave us a very orthodox solution uh, that we got out of it, but uh, it was very painful uh, at the moment. Um, continuing, the, um, the other, um, oh, wrong way, I'm sorry. The, the, um, and the only other thing is party ID. I just want you to see at the very end of this, this, it's nice to have a long series in Mexico. I'm sorry, so I always use my old graphs this way. I don't have it uh, up, to, up to the election, but this is pretty much where it stayed to the end, with, with the pre at about 30%, um, with the PAN just under 20, and the PRD actually grew a little bit at the end uh, to under 15. That still left about 40% of independents, what we call independents. They're really non-partisans. I mean, that's a better word than independents, I think, for Mexico. But, um, but in any case, the, the non-partisans uh, split in favor, really, of López Obrador, um, and, and this explains part of his role as well. That's because nonpartisans are concentrated extraordinarily in, in the central uh, part of the country, that is in the capital city especially. So, uh, so these were people voting from there basically uh, on the left to some extent. Uh, not much has changed except to say that independents or, or nonpartisans have grown as a percentage of the electorate and, ap and apparently are continuing to grow uh, on, the, on the latest finding. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, so the, the parties have a problem, but of course the parties are in strong control. They, uh, they get the vote. Um, independent candidates may be around for the next election, but they haven't been thus far, and, uh, and nonpartisan citizens seem to respond in this direction. So this continues to be the same. There are also, you can see there's a lot of, there's a lot of movement in the trends uh, uh, since the Fox victory here. Um, and a lot of that has to, is candidate driven. Uh, the pre's rise, all of this, is about Mr. Peña Nieto's campaign or pre-campaign for the presidency, as had been the case for um, Cardenas way back when or Lopez Obrador over here. Uh, the uh, public opinion, uh, party ID is weaker. It's just a weaker uh, phenomenon than it is uh, in the poli-sci literature or, and especially in the U.S. case. Um, and so um, uh, there's a lot of shifting, but it's not, uh, it's also not, not terribly dynamic beyond that. It doesn't seem to grow and it doesn't seem to become more embedded in Mexican political culture. So, that's, uh, so that remains uh, the case still. Now I think this is really my central graph and, uh, and it's not about parties but about uh, but what the political system really is about today um, and through elections. And it shows, um, it shows uh, the following. Uh, I have a long series here because of course, Mexico's had regular elections since, you know, for the 1917 Constitution on, um, and uh, and uh, 
well outdoing the Soviet Union in its day, and I don't think anybody um, comes close to this, uh, to the regularity of elections in Mexico. Very different quality, of course. Uh, these were hardly democratic elections in the period of the uh, of pre-hegemony, and it was a very slow transition. Um, people used to call it the protracted transition uh, to, to electoral democracy, uh, which was achieved. But we can see that since really 1994, 1997, well, no party in the country has gotten better in any federal election has gotten better than 40% of the vote, uh, not, not one. Uh, it's pretty low. Mr. Peña Nieto expecting 45 got 38. No, the pre in the, in the uh, legislature got barely above 30% of the vote. I mean, very, it's a very low count. Uh, the margins are in single digits since then as well. And uh, this was really why the polling, I mean, structurally, you think about it, the polling had to be wrong, uh, because what they were saying was that this was going to flip up, and so was the margin. No? It was going to grow to 15 points. Well, it didn't happen. And, and this, is, uh, this is what we still live with in terms of Mexican politics, clearly since 1997, where uh, the advent of uh, what we call divided government in Mexico, uh, non-unified government, that is a presidential party without a majority in at least one of the chambers uh, of Congress. And... Uh, um, and it doesn't look to be changing. If there was, think of it, if there was uh, any election in which the PRI was going to really get back to its ancient vanity uh, of being a majority party, well, it certainly would have been on the back of uh, uh, a handsome uh, soap opera type uh, candidate, a celebrity candidate, such as Mr. Peña Nieto, uh, with, uh, who makes very few mistakes on top of it, and seems to be a fast learner, uh, in, just after a huge uh, recession uh, and a world economy uh, that's uncertain at best uh, and that affects Mexico very quickly uh, whenever things go bad, uh, with oil prices stagnant, uh, though still very high, but stagnant, and reserves dropping. This is before the, the recent announcement of, of new, uh, of new uh, fi oil fines no, in, uh, in the Gulf um, offshore. And, uh, and finally, with, uh, with basically a tired uh, uh, or uh, incompetent opposition or rivals uh, in the race. Well, th this would have been the election to do this, and he got 38 percent. Um, which is what we should have expected a winning candidate to get at this stage of the game. So uh, th I think it's very telling that, uh, that we, we haven't gone back to anything close to majority politics, regardless of the way the numbers are translated into seats in Congress, and you'll be seeing that with Jeff. The, um, and, and, and this is crucial because, of course, the country remains terribly divided, uh, as it has been since, uh, really, since 88, since, uh, since those elections. Um, it's divided in different dimensions, uh, and it's diff and also geographically. I should just point out. I think it's the next one. I'm hoping. Oh no, um, there are th th just to illustrate a couple. This is the the state map for the fe for the presidential election. No, the the states that the PRD won in yellow, th uh, the few states that the that the PAN won in blue, and the rest the, and and really the pr the pre swept the country. But again, uh, with with an average uh, below forty percent. So in some states it did extraordinarily well, in others it squeaked through, uh, and of course in others it lost. Uh, but what I wanted to indicate was the following, for example. Um, this is an old map I have of, um, really it measures trade openness of the states uh, more than anything else, but that's highly correlated with things like uh, federal transfers in the budget to the states in a per capita basis, also to foreign investment per capita and other things, uh, all in, in everything in the same direction. So. Yeah, although the gray is kind of hard to read, what you see are, uh, well, of course, along the northern border, you have the market-oriented states and also this fringe here in the center. And the, these were then the, the most statist economies of the Federation, meaning that they, they received the largest transfers per capita. Well, economic societies that are that different, of course, demand very different things. You know, the, the, let's say the, uh, the richer middle class or the business class in the South it doesn't vote for Mr. Lopez Obrador, uh, but, uh, but of course it does. It would like his kinds of policies or what they think are his policies on the left. And so the overlap is really kind of obvious no? in terms of uh, the South, what we call the South especially, uh, although the PRI has made inroads. The PRI in the South is also 
statist, uh, and always has been. This is the old Madrasso faction that survives uh, from previous years. And uh, so some things continue on a very stable basis like this, and they make a difference in the kinds of demands that factions and parties make uh, on, of their leadership uh, down the line. And I think that's usually, that's very important to, uh, to emphasize. Um, I'm, Oh, these are radically different levels of trade openness. The, the, the ones in yellow uh, really have very low indices. Of course, you know, the big thing from down there is like oil, of course, in many of those states, and that's federal, so it's not, it wasn't attributed to their economies at the time. And in fact, it leaves little. And the north, of course, is, is, is just an open... No, 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 it's a percentage of uh, imports and exports over, uh, over state GDP. I mean, it's, you know, it's trade open is pure and simple. Uh, but it, do, it does correlate with those other, uh, all those other elements, so it's rather important that way. I want to go through this quickly. The, the other kind of pattern, I haven't, this I haven't uh, updated yet to, to include the last election, but uh, what this shows is uh, are the, the average party shares uh, per district, the same congressional districts over the last three elections, this shows two. Um, and what's important here is the following. Um, the center triangle here, the way you read this is say this point, you know, indicates a strong priest uh, district uh, getting about 70% of the vote on the pre um, a scale with about 25% for the PAN and uh, very little uh, for the uh, PRD, no, you know, 10% or less. Um, and so there's a very strong pre-district, uh, but uh, uh, regardless of whether it's won or, or lost the district, okay, I mean, this is just the vote shares on average. Um, you, this, uh, anything in this little triangle in the center would be sort of a tripartite uh, district. There are very few. It's, about, it's less than 10% of the total of the 300 districts. Uh, there are very few where the three parties effectively compete. Uh, and the other, uh, the other thing to really note is, despite the fact that the pre gets, as it did in this last election, most uh, plurality triumphs in the country, it has forever, practically, um, on, the, on the frontier between the left and the pre, right here, and between the pan and the pre, right here, of course, there are many districts that are very competitive. Um, but look at, the, look at the area between the PAN and the PRD. Um, there are very few districts, mostly in the, in, the, in the capital city, where the left competes against the pan. So this makes of them very... Uh, stable partners, for example, on the political dimensions uh, of uh, contestation or of politics, uh, if, for example, at IFE, uh, at the Electoral Institute and at other places, uh, they, really, uh, they really share a common enemy uh, and do not bother each other. The 2006 election was quite extraordinary, anomalous uh, in that sense, uh, and, the, uh, and, uh, and it explains a great deal of the dynamics of, say, IFE uh, and uh, political reform over the over the, over many years now, um, which uh, hasn't changed with this election. Okay, it's remained the same. Their geography is simply different, um, and this has been true from the beginning. It remains true, and it makes for often very costly alliances, of course, down the line in terms of Congress and in other on other fronts for policy. So. To sum up, because I have to pass this on to uh, to Jeff, the um, well, the vanities I think were the were the expectation that with the uh, with the return of the pre, in some ways we would be with the political balance in the country would change. It, it did not, and that's the that's the central verity. It did not. It remains a very divided country. It's not simply in partisan terms. It's of course an ideological, generational, regional. I mean, you know, you, you can you name the cleavage and you'll find it. Very hard for central party leaderships to uh, align factional interests uh, behind any set of reforms because they're also divided in the same way. And this is especially true of the pre. I didn't show pre maps because because I don't have a current one uh, of their regional splits, uh, um, but the uh, and factional splits. But the um, but in any case, it, it remains the case. It's very hard uh, to structure consensus to build consensus out of that kind of pluralism uh, across the party line, across party lines, and within them, it's been very tough, and I, and and I don't think we've advanced beyond that. It's also the case that uh, that 
you just don't seem to have uh, any push uh, in the end that's credible for majority or majoritarian politics in the country. This, uh, I think, has to be said from the outset, uh, much as people think that's the way to get out of the troubles, out of our paralysis, out of the doldrums that, uh, that especially policymaking has been uh, in for several years now. It's difficult on the back of this kind of division, uh, political division in the country. And so our expectations uh, really should be, uh, I think, tuned uh, over and over again. We just have to remember to do this. You have to, uh, you really have to underestimate uh, the, the possibilities in Mexican politics for uh, reform consensus or for policy shifts uh, that are major in almost any policy arena that you can come up with. Um, it's very tough. Uh, without, even, even without looking at the opinion profiles, you find uh, the difficulty in uh, in, in getting over the, uh, the hurdle of lack of majority support for uh, major reform almost in any area of policy. Uh, that remains the case. Everyone, everyone wants things to be better and fast. Uh, we all want, what, less violence, more prosperity, uh, you know, uh, uh, dy very dynamic growth. Uh, we would like better education now, and of course we want effective uh, access to health services that of quality and you know, down the line, um, but all of these require uh, major reforms in one or more policy arenas that do not count with majority support, be it on the fiscal side or in the policy relevant side, the, 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 the sector specific uh, side of policy. And I think that that remains the case in Mexico. Nothing has really changed in that sense. Uh, so uh, it's better to you know, it's better for us to downgrade or deflate our expectations rather than to become frustrated yet one more time. The PRI will go through this round over the next few years, is my guess. Um, and, uh, and in the meantime, we muddle through. Um, but we've been muddling through for a while now. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'll welcome all questions uh, later. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to follow a roundtable format. I want to make one correction. I said there were 18 governorships up for grabs. It was uh, 14 state legislatures were up for grabs in this election, as well as uh, six governorships. Um, the, uh, be before we move into thinking about how this election played out in terms of the legislative results and the other possible policy implications of the election, we want to take a little bit of time to talk, uh, to have some questions and discussion of uh, Federico's presentation. I want to throw out, uh, first of all, um, one, one question for Federico uh, regarding exit polling. Um, what did we learn from this, aside from the geographic distribution of the vote that you've described, what did we learn about the voters themselves, uh, particularly in an election where for the first time a major party can, uh, ran a female candidate? Was there any noticeable uh, effect on, on uh, women voting patterns? Uh, was there a bias against the, uh, the, the female candidate because of her gender? Um, and what did we see in terms of the youth vote? Uh, one of the things that you mentioned were the student protests against uh, Enrique Peña Nieto uh, at the Ibero-Americana University, which morphed into a major social networking uh, sort of uh, Mexican Spring, uh, the, the uh, 132 movement, or Yo Soy 132 movement, I am number 132, uh, which was a reference to uh, the uh, claims by the Peña Nieto uh, campaign that there had not been that many students actually protesting and that there were uh, campaign uh, uh, agents manipulating, uh, from the Lopez Obrador campaign, manipulating uh, the, his, the um, uh, the, the protests at the Ibero-Americana. Uh, this morphed into a, a massive movement where uh, thousands and uh, thousands of people signed up to say that they were they were in uh, agreement with the protesters, that they were number 132, the 132nd uh, protester uh, against uh, Enrique Peña Nieto. What did we learn about who voted in this election and what they thought from the exit polls that, that you've seen? I'll be, I'll be fast on there. There have been some things published, uh, even bad polls. You know, uh, the, most of the exit polls also got it wrong. Okay, I mean they should be extraordinarily precise, and have been in the past <clears throat> in federal elections, but in this one most most inflated. 
uh, the pre-vote as well. Reformas was uh, more exact and a couple of others. Um, but to get back to the questions on gender, well, uh, w women voted for the uh, the soap opera hunk instead of the woman, um, uh, so that uh, Peña Nieto, of course, ha uh, re revived what was an old uh, gender gap uh, in the pre's favor. Um, uh, this goes back, way back in polling the, from since forever. Um, for a very different reason, perhaps this time, but really that has not been looked at, and and, and nobody's been doing uh, gender voting studies in Mexico in a serious way recently. So th th it's an important topic to look at. Vasquez Mota, I should say, also did have some impact. Um, uh, her vote was split between the genders. In uh, her her low vote was split um, uh, evenly, uh, which is a change in uh, PAN patterns. Which uh, op you know the opposition to the pre was always favored by males of course, uh, uh, but uh, so to have a split is something of an improvement, and Lopez Obrador maintained a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a bias in his favor uh, amongst uh, male voters, uh, which has also been fairly constant for a very long time. The, uh, on the priest profile, I think this is actually important, you know, uh, of the most of the exit polls, almost half of the sample in any of them uh, is uh, a, a of voters who, with very low uh, schooling levels, that is, uh, completed primary, uh, completed primary or at, at most, no, not much higher than that. It's, all, it's almost 50% of the country, just under. <clears throat> About 50% of Peña Nieto's vote came from from uh, voters of that type. So that would mean that a quarter of the uh, of his, uh, not a quarter of his vote, 25% of his 38 points came from those kinds of voters. This is typical uh, yeah, from ancient patterns in the pre. This has always been the case. Uh, the youth, and of course they voted for Lopez Obrador in this election. In the past they voted for the PAN, uh, typically, or Lopez Obrador. So that pattern remains the same. Youth, Peña Nieto did better amongst, of course, uneducated young voters um, than uh, they had been doing in the recent past. And the PAN especially lost out uh, what had been one of its uh, key segments of support in the past, uh, but Lopez Obrador did fine. And the only other thing that's important is that the uh, the rural vote gave the pre uh, uh, back. This also is a revival of the past, uh, a very large uh, margin, uh, about 15 points more than uh, the other candidates, uh, either of them, uh, which is a, a, a strong rural bonus for the pre. And the cities tended to favor the other two candidates more uh, in relative terms. So the demographics are rather similar to the past. Uh, there, there, there is no big change, although something had changed under. Fox especially um, back in 2000, but uh, but we're back to the pattern of the 90s, if you like, and, and I think this is the the general pattern that we've uh, that we've always had here. Uh, on um, on just on 132 for one second. Um, uh, um, the 132 also is factional, of course. There is the, you know, there is a sector where it started uh, in the private universities. It, the real surprise in this movement is that the private university uh, students are involved. Um, uh, the children of the elite are, uh, are involved in the movement. That's different uh, from the past. The, uh, but. Um, they, they seem to have a more, much more moderate line. They've been, among, well, they've been more anti-Televisa than anti-Pena. This is the easiest way of saying it. Whereas the public university students have been more anti-Pena than anti-Televisa. Now, we all, we all understand that in Mexico, if, if you're anti-Televisa, you're anti-Pena by definition and, and vice versa. I mean, this, this is just a fact of life. Uh, we saw it. It was part of the suit. I didn't mention the post-electoral dispute that just got resolved in Pena's favor uh, by the electoral tribunal. But uh, this was part of the, uh, you know, of the, of the list of, uh, of um, uh, causes for... Uh, that the left was demanding uh, be used to uh, annul uh, or invalidate uh, the election uh, was the media control uh, uh, and uh, disproportionate um, coverage, uh, soft and hard news, uh, uh, and advertising as well for, uh, for Pena. Um, 
So in the end, the, 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 two student, the two halves of the student movement really basically share the same demands, the key demands, but they do it with different rhetoric. Um, and the, um, and uh, th they have a decision coming in the next few days, uh, depending on what Mr. Lopez Obrador announces this weekend uh, in, in his big speech in, in the Socolo. Um, it will depend a little bit uh, on that to know which way this goes. So really the question is not so much about the student movement, as about what Mr. Lopez Obrador is going to do, and that you know the speculation uh, goes everywhere. I'm, I'm taking the spin. I'm using the spin these days that he's an Old Testament prophet now, and and I mean something actually rather serious by that. The uh, that that he's basically leaving active politics or partisan politics, or uh, certainly institutional politics. Uh, uh, aside uh, completely, I believe that, uh, and that he's going to dedicate himself to preaching again. And maybe he'll be on tour uh, through the country again. It didn't, it got him a lot of votes, but it didn't get him a lot of organization. No, he didn't build anything on this basis. His main support really came from the center of the country where the PRD is in control. I mean, it was the PRD that gave him his vote uh, um, not, and, and not his own movement. Um, and so I think that, um, uh, but I think he wants that. I think that's what he's going to do. And, uh, you know, prophets are useful. Um, it's good for them to be, to be out there crying into the wind. Uh, and one day or another, someone will listen to them, as you know, and, and uh, things may change. Uh, I think that's going to be his role for a while. Uh, of course, the Mexican media and pundits are treating it more as simply a strategic ploy to uh, come back in six years and run again for the presidency, even at the head of a small party and go down to defeat, noble defeat, uh, but you know, doing the same old thing as if he were, I can't remember the name of, who was the, somebody must know the, was a, a Democratic candidate here in the U.S. that you know must have run for the nomination for in eight different elections or something? Who was that? Brian. No, no, no. In the post-war, post-war, uh, some governor. I can't remember. Well, well, it would be a Ron Paul. That's exactly right. Uh, pardon? That's correct. <laughs> no, not McCarthy. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. This is uh, minutia. That's not important. But the. There we go, Harold Stassen, thank you. Um, oh, Republican, that was the reason. Um, well, in any case, um, I, I don't believe that. I mean, I, I actually don't believe that of Lopez Obrador. I don't think that's his uh, key objective. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, he, you know, this is a man that uh, in two presidential elections in a row has garnered a third of the national vote. It's very strong, um, a very strong performance despite, especially in this, in this second campaign, uh, basically having been absent from the media for years because of, uh, because of the rejection of his more radical protests six years ago. And, uh, and, and because he named names, right? You know, he said nasty things about big business by name and uh, this just isn't liked. And of course, he's not very nice about the media. Uh, and especially their, uh, its owners. Um, so um, he, this is a really powerful performance by him uh, for two elections in a row. It leaves something very strong for the left to capitalize uh, to the future. And it's, they're simply not going to disappear. Um, um, we'll see what, you know, how candidate, candidate selection goes the next time around. That's a different story, but there seems to be a solid basis to what he's doing. He actually has created something different than Mr. Carthen had done in the early years, something stronger uh, and, and a little more anchored, I think, in, in, uh, in uh, both in their uh, bastions as well as in an ideological line that is very consistent over time and that probably anchors the party system better than anything else uh, in Mexico and has for several years now. So I think that role is very positive, even if he personally doesn't have much of a role to play anymore, uh, which is my reading. So better he cry in the wilderness um, uh, uh, like an Old Testament prophet than, uh, than to think of him in more formal uh, public uh, uh, dynamics uh, of a politician angling uh, to win power. I, I think he's now past that. For a few questions, why don't we take a, a slate of questions so that you can process those uh, and we'll just go uh, around the circle here and start with David Gaddis Smith. And again, please speak up. Uh, we, we have a microphone uh, at each table. We're trying to make sure we have the audio for the <laughs> recording. 
few plays that were former polls, but then there was that outlier YouTube poll that had an armor at one point, so I was wondering how that fit into how you thought about the former. And the independents, there's so many independents. I mean, I wonder how that really factors into putting all these pollsters are doing their work. I mean, are you maybe giving them too much, too much grief when they have to deal with this huge floating a pool. Maria does Harris had her sort of little Genesis blog where she tried to figure out how to, what happened. And she did very well this time in 2000, but she completely goofed up in 2006. And I was wondering also for the youth vote. You, um, the exit polls I saw said Peña Nieto actually won the youth vote, but you're saying that that may not be the case. Uh, next question. Uh, wait. Who is? I have one observation and one and a half questions. Yeah. Uh, the observation. Very divided country. Very hard to develop cross-party consensus. Very hard to escape policy paralysis. Almost impossible to pass effective reforms. Sounds a hell of a lot like the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the question. Um, well, one question premised on, on that analysis. How do you break this slide down? What is it going to take? Uh, is it going to take a, a, a 9.1 earthquake? Uh, do you see any realistic scenario uh, for uh, bringing together the competing factions to actually develop consensus? And a related question, did Mexicans vote for Peña Nieto, hoping that you would actually get things done? even given a strong minority opposition to Congress. And more generally, what did they base their votes on? What did the exit poll show about the uh, key motivating issues in this election? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, oh, I want no, there's more. A uh, question down here. The, my question is, we have taking a focus more on the trans border aspect of, of this election, uh, given that the Pew Hispanic research found that 1.4 million <coughs> Mexicans used to live here returned to Mexico, and they can vote if they're of age, and that dual nationals, Mexicans residing in the United States and other countries, can also vote. So my question is, to what extent uh, that voting block influences politics in Mexico. And, and, and I, I've read several articles that, that seem to indicate that they may have favored the pre Peña Nieto over others, or the candidates like Obrador and, uh, and, and others. So to, to what extent uh, do you have any uh, uh, metrics to show that, that influence? Uh, Okay. Great. Um, one, one last one, and, one last and then we'll have to. <coughs> I, I, uh, you sort of touched on it. Uh, there's a seven percent uh, difference between the poll numbers and the actual results, and that that, that was three times more than these in the states. Now, you sort of touched on it. Is that because of bias by the pollsters, or is there something else? Is it just poor pollstering, uh, or is it uh, is it a bias that you that, that Okay, um, let's see, um, David, quickly. Um, youth, um, the, the youth, just the, the young court, that is, say, 18 to 29, um, have very similar numbers, actually, for uh, Lopez Obrador as against Pena. They're basically tied there. Um, but, the, um, but, of course, once you cross it with uh, education, then it becomes very clear that, uh, that you're that you're talking about, you know, the old societies against the new one, uh, with the pre winning handily in the old society uh, as it had before, and and not making much headway in the new. And that's I think that remains the critical problem. So no, he didn't, you know, and where even had he won them, and not you know just to be getting people that have only gone through primary is not, you know, to to base your coalition only on the poor vote is not, uh, is just not. A winning strategy down the line. You can still eke out an election, okay? Uh, but you're not. It's not bound to be a particularly strong one, and that's really how I'm. I'm still looking at this. 
With, uh, just with respect to Maria de las Heras, um, is when, when her faction was out of uh, uh, control, that is not in control of the party politics or the PRI, uh, she, her projections, because they're not quite polls, her projections uh, turned out to be very good, as they were in this last election. Um, uh, put uh, put her, uh, her factional leader at the top of the ticket for the PRI, and she inflates um, even her projections. So I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, you know, that's the pattern with Maria de los Cerdos, who just died. She's really one of the pioneers of polling, of political polling in the country, and she started as the... Uh, as the official pollster for the PRI back when, you know, when she set herself up professionally. And so she was always clear about what she was doing. I mean, it's not a, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't out there faking it as a scientist, as most of the others do. Um, uh, Wayne, the, uh, yes, it is like the U.S., you're right. Uh, you, you've become Mexicanized um, and um, over time. And we're, we're, we're looking for the 1950s, right, or something. I mean, I'm not really sure what it is uh, we're hoping to get. It's one of our vanities on the south of the border, to the south of the border. Uh, and I'm worried that um, it's not clear what, how big a shock you need to move things. The last time uh, we got anything, any movement on, uh, you know, in the social, uh, economic, and political policy fields was with the very long and deep uh, uh, crack from associated with the debt crisis, you no, know, from the 80s. I mean, that was the last time that, that we were able to to, uh, to garner sufficient support under very able leadership uh, of Mr. Salinas at that time uh, to be able to, uh, to 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 get these reforms. But of course, the the country had not fragmented politically by that point yet. Uh, he was able still to get over that uh, on the basis of very sharp uh, vote counts, no, in 1988. Um, uh, so, um, so we're not there anymore, and I don't know what kind of a shock it requires. Uh, you know, you would have thought the crack uh, uh, in, uh, in 2008, 2009 w uh, might have uh, given some room for maneuver, uh, and it did not. Um, uh, our, uh, we're at sort of an equilibrium, a steady state now of, you know, 12,000 dead a year from, uh, from the uh, drug wars. Uh, that doesn't seem to be enough uh, to push it. I mean, that's a huge number of dead, uh, the, uh, you know, bodies that have accumulated uh, over the course of the country. I barely mentioned it. I should have said something about that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, people support the president uh, on the general uh, strategy of confronting drugs and crime crime in Mexico, but uh, they all think he's been failing, or the majority thinks he's been failing, and it's becoming very clear again that, the, you know, the, well, the, you know, the drug lords are winning the war uh, as against the government, or the, the government just hasn't been able to produce results. And so uh, it's still the number one problem the, that the country faces, according to strong majorities in the polling, uh, all of them. And yet, um, uh, it was barely uh, uh, an issue in the campaigns, okay? So, um, and when they did talk about it, they were all uncomfortably close to each other in terms of what, the, uh, of what they suggested. So that we, you know, we haven't had uh, um, a full-out political debate on this. Uh, in the media, you see quite a bit, in the, amongst the pundits, quite a bit. But, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't gotten to the top, notwithstanding six years of speech after speech after speech by the president uh, emphasizing this. He just hasn't been able to convince anybody that he, that not, not that the, that he shouldn't be confronting the drugs, but that the government shouldn't be uh, doing that, but that, uh, that he's had it, that it's worth the price and the price tag is high. You know, when here in this country, when you guys got to 50,000 uh, dead in Indochina, uh, the majority went against staying in Vietnam um, back when, uh, many years ago. We're over that already, and you know, it's really quite strong. Um, so the mobilizing issues, Wayne, are very difficult to define in that sense because uh, nothing seems to really crack, you know, to, to get, to move it off the dime, right? We're, it's just not occurring, uh, despite lots of hard times uh, and uh, key events that uh, might have engendered uh, something different. Many people, especially in the business community, uh, claim that what you need, of course, is, uh, is simply a 
a lucky turn of the wheel of fortune in terms of leadership. Uh, you know, if only we could find another Salinas, um, uh, maybe some, somebody with that kind of drive and know-how and, and talent for coordinating a team, uh, getting others on board, giving them what, it, what they need to join, uh, to join the government, uh, and, uh, and to push policy reform in quite a few areas, right? Uh, as was the case back in the early 90s, um, 20 years ago. Uh, Peña, well, people are hoping that Peña is that, but you know, Atlacomulco was never very close to the technocracy. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, their model of business, I'm going to call it this way, business politics uh, was always extraordinarily corrupt. Um, it, it's about giving two, it, it's about sweetheart contracts between uh, uh, the, the big political families and business interests that uh, hope to get the contracts and, and, and the credits to move uh, into new sectors of activity. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure that that adds up to a true uh, reform bias, okay? Uh, so you look for mobilizing issues, we haven't got them yet, we have to wait. Uh, and uh, we waited many years for democracy. We may, hmm? What did people say they Well, the, you know, they preferred the candidate. They say they like the candidate's proposals, but you know, that's not really meaningful in a poll when, when they answer that. Uh, some people say they like the party, um, you know, the chunk. I mean, they give you the usual breakdown, but it's not, but they don't point to individual issues. Now, part of that is because of the way pollsters phrase it. Uh, so they, they have a standard question on motives for voting that does not include specific policies. Okay, that, well, that's right. So uh, the real answer to your question is I don't know um, because the pollsters did, don't let us know. I mean, they don't make the question, uh, you know, uh, did so and so, did your, the position on law and order uh, motivate your vote or not? Did the position with respect to the job creation or whatever it would be? No, they don't ask the question that way, okay? Uh, so I don't know. Uh, on the border, I'm sorry, on the transborder uh, people, I wanted to get to that quickly. That, you know, the, the, something like, a, what is it, about a quarter of a million people, I believe, thereabouts, voted uh, from abroad, that is from mostly the U.S., but also other countries. Uh, the vote, uh, the actually vote, the, um, the plurality went for Vasquez Mota from that vote, uh, not Peña, and, um, uh, and it ended up not mattering. But uh, in terms of voting abroad, the, uh, we don't ask the question either. The pollsters are, uh, you know, it's expensive to ask too many questions on, in polls. I mean, so you have to understand, and we don't do telephone polling, so, um, so that it's, it, it, you know, every question is just, you know, well, is, a, is, a, is an extra piece of the fee that you have to pay people to go out and knock on doors, no out in the boonies. Um, we don't know about people having gone back. Uh, you know, uh, they don't ask whether they were uh, recently outside the country or if they, uh, if they know uh, usually migrants or somebody, you know, somebody who may have left for the U.S. or if they're connected. Mexican pollsters don't tend to ask that question in election polling. So um, there are a few that, that might have done so, and we'll, we'll find out over the next few months. But So it's very hard to answer that question. We, uh, uh, it often is done in reverse. I mean, it's, it's, it's asked in a different way, and it's, it's been very tough. So we don't have the metrics to be able to figure out what, what uh, the, their impact could be uh, in, in any electoral context, although uh, over the last, what, five, uh, six years or so, uh, there has been increasing um, um, support for the idea that the return to Mexican communities and simply the sending of monies, no, in the, in the big days of uh, remesas, of uh, remittances, um, uh, they were, uh, they're, and those are climbing back up right now, that their opinions mattered. Okay, I mean that that they actually had an impact, but we but that's uh, that was especially for local races and local polling, and so that that's where we have some information, but not for uh, national level politics or elections, not yet anyway. Um, and I have a last oh the policy bias. Um, no, what I'm claiming is that uh, the uh, of course it is bias. It's statistical bias uh, after the fact. No, and uh, the. The, the, the amount of error that's registered uh, between any pollster and, and the actual result and the mean of the industry. Um, partisan bias that we can measure to the past, that is a, uh, a, a polling house may be in f more in favor of say the pre than of the left or more in favor of the pre than of the PAN, depending on, again, on the geography no, of the, of, uh, that you're talking about. Um, 
there, again, what, what I had claimed was, we're not certain of this yet and we're doing the work right now, but the, um, it looks about somewhere between 40 and 50% of this year's bias seems to be explained by partisan bias known from past experience in those polls, amongst the, the record of those pollsters in the past, both in federal races and in local races, gubernatorial contests. But uh, that's not, you know, that's not a very high amount. I mean, that leaves half of it to be explained. And uh, it's just not really clear where it comes from. I mean, it's a major. Well, no. It, the problem is really that it was all in one direction, but but the, the, you're right that technique matters. The uh, the pollsters, the, it's, there's one poll that was uh, a month before election day got it pretty much right, which was the Baruman poll. It's not quite released yet. We don't have the data. I don't know, academics own it from several universities and we just haven't seen it yet. But, you know, that, yes, it was a very large sample. It went across the country. They went back three times and knocked on the door to find the, you know, the original uh, uh, sample, uh, the original um, 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 person uh, indicated uh, in their protocol, and uh, there was no substitution. Uh, so they didn't just go nine houses down the line and knock on that door. No, they, they didn't substitute. They they went to another list for for to you know they had a bigger list than necessary in order to uh, compensate for that. Uh, so technically, very very professional poll, very costly one, of course, uh, and uh, and th they did get it right. So yeah, you can yeah you can fix that. Uh, uh, and but the point is between uh, that was about three thousand, a little over three thousand, the sample nationwide. Most polling uh, for the election is either uh, is between 1,000 and uh, 1,500. The, the median poll is about 1,200 uh, from this past campaign. Now, you know that the difference in probabilities of reaching a representative sample in national terms in going from, say, 1,200 to three times that size, 36, well, you, you know, you get what, about 5% more? of a chance. I mean, you, you don't get much for the money, okay? So it's, it's not really about that, okay? That's my, I, I don't think it's about sampling, and I don't think it's about the, uh, you know, how clean or text, you know, textbook uh, um, 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 uh, they are in their operations in the field. I just don't think that's the case. There must be a lot of, uh, there, may, there may be some sampling error, and there must be a lot of non-sampling error, that's obvious. But, um, it looks like there's something more. Okay. Very good. Well, we're going to move the discussion on to focus on the gov governmental implications, uh, what we can uh, look forward to from Mexico's next Congress, and uh, what specifically the policy implications are of these uh, election results. Um, I, I'm going to uh, move directly to Jeff Weldon, who's going to give his presentation, and we'll follow the same format that we did here. Um, again, if you need to get up, move around, uh, stretch your legs, please feel free as we make the transition. Uh, but we are going to try to forge ahead to stay on track in terms of our uh, discussions. So let me pull up our second presentation. We're back with Jeffrey Weldon, who is a professor of political science at the ITAM, a colleague of uh, uh, Federico Estevez. Jeff is going to be focused on uh, primarily what we expect to see out of Mexico's new Congress, uh, which just took office and is now uh, representative of the results of the, uh, the July elections. Uh, there is a brief period during which Mexico's outgoing president will interact with Mexico's incoming Congress or new Congress uh, until uh, the president-elect Enrique Peña Nieto takes office on December 1st, 2012. So we have a couple more months, uh, 60, 70 days or so of, of crossover governance, um, and Jeff is going to talk us through what we can expect uh, in the short term and the longer term uh, from Congress. Okay, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, David. It's, it's great to be back. Um, it's been a sexenio since I've been here. And so, um, well, for some reason, now yeah. Now the decree's back. It's free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and um, but it's 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 really nice. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk today about the um, what 
The coalitions in Congress have been for the last several um, legislatures since we've had divided government. Um, and then speculate on how we can see things coming up in the future according to how they be behaved in the past. Um, and it's, it's, you know, usually they're pretty predictable on how they do things. We've had um, now 15 years of divided government in Mexico. We're going to have an additional um, six um, because the chamber deputies, there's no majority, and the Senate, there will be no majority for the full six years. Um, Peña Nieto may get a majority in the Chamber of Deputies, but he still won't have it in the Senate. And so we're going to have um, more of the same um, for some time. And there, there's really no expectation to change that. I stole one of Federico's things. Um, and uh, because this kind of explains where we're, what's happening. There's a lot of elasticity um, in the pre-vote um, when they win districts. Um, a lot of their districts are right at the border lines. And so if you see the border there between the blue and the red, and between the red and the yellow, um, what happened in, this is the 2006 election, right, Federico? The both, uh, two, both 2006 and 2009. And 2009. Okay, yeah. Um, what has happened is that the, um, the blue lines have turned, I mean, the, the blue ones right on the border have turned red. They've come down this way. Um, a little bit to some degree. And um, the yellow ones also turned a little bit more red in some cases. Um, actually, they turned, they turned into light, you know, light green. They turned into verdes. Um, but the, um, there's a lot of places right at the borderline. Um, and so the pre can, from one election to the next, can win a whole bunch more seats or lose a lot of seats like they did in 2006. Um, and that's actually the big question right now for 2015. You know, um, they could end up winning if Peña Nieto does well, um, and the economy holds together um, for the next three years. Um, then he actually might um, do very, very well in, in the midterms and get an outright majority in the chamber of deputies. Or if the economy um, tanks, which I think, which is what I would bet on right now. Um, then I think you know he could go way down to levels like we saw um, back in 2006, which would be very interesting too. Um, and so he would be basically governing as um, as Calderon has been governing for the last three years. And so we'll see how that that works out. Um, the I'm going to jump one more. Yeah, um, we're going to compare here the 57th and the 50 and the 62nd legislatures. Um, the 57th was the first one with divided government. This is 1997 to 2000. This is the first one with the um, thoroughly modern IFE, um, the first really free elections that everyone recognizes as free elections in Mexico. Um, the PRI had 47.8 of the seats. These are the average number of seats um, for the PRI because um, they were the people were changing around quite a bit, and uh, they don't add up to 100 because there's some um, independence, like a good number of independents actually during that term. So the PRI had 47.8%, just a little bit less than 50%, um, and they had no coalition partner at the time. The Verdes were not with them. And um, they were supposed to be, but they weren't. You know, from the very beginning, they made, itself, they made themselves clear that they were working independently. Um, in the 62nd legislature, despite a lot of expectations, um, the PRI actually did, has done worse. They're at 42.4%. Um, with the um, Verdes, again, another 5.8%. Uh, um, and uh, with Panal, there's another 2%. I think if you add all of these up, they get exactly 251 seats out of 500, which is an absolute bare majority. Um, the um, the pre added five deputies um, yesterday. What, what day is it? No, on Tuesday. Um, they added five deputies, but those were transferred from the Verdes. There were people who are actually always priestas, and they were, you know, posing as Verdes in order to allow the pre to be overrepresented um, by the electoral rules and everything. But they um, ended up having, um, but it was just an internal switch. Um, I would, my expectation is actually that probably more people will move over to this coalition over time. But um, whatever it is, they're really working right at the margin. And if the opposition, the two main opposition parties, um, you know, have good discipline and good turnout in Congress, it's going to be very, very hard for the PRI to govern um, with majorities. Um, in fact, the PRI is worse than they were in the 2009 election. 
Um, in the 2009 election, they had about 48% of the seats. And together with the Verdes, who had about 21 seats, which would be um, uh, 4% or so, um, they did have an, an absolute majority. They had a, an easy absolute majority. They very rarely used it. There are very, very few elections in which the PRI and the Verdes voted together against everybody else. Um, whenever the, they were voting together against the PAN, the PRD was also involved. And so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a minimum winning coalition in any sense that, that mattered. Um, and so the, um, the PRIs actually did worse in this election than they did, both in terms of votes, clearly in terms of votes and in terms of seats, than they did in the, um, in the midterms last time, which was very surprising after a presidential election in which their candidate you know, had a pretty good margin over second place. Um, these are the coalitions going back to, um, to the 97 election. It says 98 because we didn't have the um, roll call votes um, recorded until 98. And um, as you can see, the, the, the most divided legislature was the 57th, which, was, which would be from 98 to 2000. This was the last term of Cedillo. Um, what we're really looking at now is Peña Nieto, in his first term anyway, is going to be like Cedillo was in his second half. Um, without a majority in Congress. Um, and that was actually a very divided um, legislature. The, the PRI and the PAN, which has been the dominant coalition, as you can see, through the whole period, um, was still only voting together um, three quarters of the time. And the PRI, pre, um, was voting, the PRD was voting against the PRI 53% of the time, was, was with them 53% of the time. So it was very, much, much lower. Um, and uh, then we see that during the years of Fox and Calderon, um, especially with Fox, you know, there's general agreement and everyone with the PAN and PRD voting most distantly. And then very actually high levels of um, cooperation between the PRI and the PAN during the years of Calderon, despite what we think we know, um, and, um, which, is, which is kind of interesting. The um, 57th legislature, though, I the 60 sec 61st legislature, the last one, this is the last half of Calderon, was kind of interesting, though, in that um, there was a pattern in which the, the PRI would move from the center. We always think that, you know, the PAN's on the right, the PRI's in the center, and the PRD's on the left. Um, but there were two periods in which the PRD, um, which the PRI jumped from the center to the right and the PAN was actually voting in the middle, which is actually very unusual for uh, the president's party. Um, and this was in um, the, OT is Otoño and Primavera, up on the top there, of the years. Fall and spring. Fall and, spring. And, um, and especially if you go to um, the fall of 2011, um, the PRD was voting with the PAN 85% of the time, 86% of the time, and with the PRI only 81% of the time. If you all agree that the PRD is on the left, it means that they were voting less often with the PRI, which means that they would be on the right. Um, I have also sh so show some graphs that would demonstrate more or less what this would look like, um, and, and I'll explain why we don't have the last graphs. But, um, but most of the time, you know, there's not much difference between the parties, but there was one time there that we can see that the PRI was beginning to actually vote on the right, at the time, actually, that they were defend defining their agenda. The, no, the PRI, the PRI was voting on the right at the time that they were um, promoting their agenda. It was clear these were the, this was when Pena was putting control over his deputies in Congress. This is, these were his deputies in, in the chamber deputies. And um, at this point, they were actually trying to, um, to show what they were standing for. Okay, this is called, um, this system is called Nominate, um, which defines each of these points right there is a deputy um, in two-dimensional space. Um, left to right is just regular left-right um, social economic dimension. Up and down depends a little bit on the legislature, but it's usually political reform versus you know, anti-reform. Um, sometimes in this particular legislature, it's, it's actually social agenda, and the pond was on a different, different level on that one. This is the 57th legislature. The pawns in blue, the, the um, PRD is always going to be in yellow. The PRI is green. Um, 
this is between, I, I did these graphs before the pre turned themselves into reds, but um, but and there is a red party anyway, the 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 PT, which is the one in there already, and that's their color. So anyway, the the in this legislature, um, um, the pre was on the right, um, which is interesting. You know, this is not something that most people um, recognize, but they were voting to the right. They were the party that was most distant from the distant from the PRD, and so they're they're. We're actually pretty far to the right. Um, this was the case, um, looking back, we didn't have votes before um, 98, but I've looked at um, how people were um, debating in, um, the, in the, uh, the, era, the era de los debates, going back to about 85. And so from about the time that Salinas kind of took control of the PRI um, in about 85, when his coalition was really dominant, the um, PRI was voting on the right hands of the spectrum on social economic issues, despite what they think they do. Um, now, when um, Fox comes into power, this is 2000 to 2003, the, pr the PAN is on the right now. Um, the PRI is all over in the middle, and they're all spread out, which means that there's some indiscipline there. Um, and the Verdes are the ones up on the top there. Um, they started actually on the very, very, very far right. And then after one year, then they jumped over and then they came down. They kind of went up like this and then they came down like that, if you do it by each period. Um, the PRD is way over here and then the, um, the PT and the other parties are over on this side. Um, this is actually typical of a party in government because um, they have to really do what Hacienda wants them to do. I mean, most of these divided votes are based on Hacienda votes. Um, Hacienda is the treasury, and these are the, you know, the, the budget, the um, tax bills and everything. And the ideal point of Hacienda is way over in the corner over there. Um, <laughs> when I do this in my office, actually, I point out that way, and that's the econ department, which is the same thing as Hacienda. Um, and so... So they all have to respond to someone way out there. Um, and this is the um, 59th legislature. This is the second half of Fox. This is the one that we've actually studied most. Again, the ponds over there, the, the pre's down here. Here's a difference in the pre, though. The, um, the pre that has the X through it is um, up on the top, right on the, on the boundary where next to the uh, orange guys. Um, that's El Bester Gordillo. And then down at the bottom um, was um, Choi Fett, and at that time, Manlio. Um, and there was a big division in the party at the time. All the white spaces up there, the little white people, are people that were in the pre um, and left with Elvis there. So these were the Elvistas in the party, and they left um, based on um, partisan, um, factional divisions, and, and on a lot of major issue differences. Primer, yeah. Is Elba Stero is the, yeah. Who is Manlio? Yeah. Elba, Elba Stero is the head of the, um, of the teachers' union um, and has been a, um, and was a supporter of, I mean, she was the secretary general of the PRI back in the years before the election to 2006. Um, and eventually left the PRI to um, form the PANAL, sort of left the PRI to form the PANAL. And um, Manlio Fabio is the um, current head of the, new, new current head of, this, of the Chamber of Deputies, but he's actually, he's rec he actually has a different position than he did at this time. Um, and um, we can see all the parties are really nicely bunched together, but there was a big, actu there was a big difference actually between the northern and southern priestess, which actually corresponds to north and south. In, in Mexico also, interestingly enough. On social issues, so. On, on, no, on reform issues. And so this was, and so the ones who are most anti-reform are on the bottom, and, the, and everyone else is more pro-reform, pro including Elba at the time, okay. as long as we're not talking about educational reform. Which, um, jump, jumping in with a yeah, quick question. Sure. I mean, if, if the map that Federico <laughs> showed us earlier showed a south of Mexico where the pre is competitive, but is very state-based uh -huh. and uh, dependent on uh, parastatal industries, et cetera, while the North, the PRI, is competing against the PAN uh, and has to perhaps be more moderate uh, in, in its um, positions. Does that help to explain that 
No, it's the other way around. I mean, the, the pre and the, I mean, that would, it depends on the issues. Okay. I mean, the pre in the north is economically much further to the right because that's where the pond is in the north than it is in the south because they're competing against the PRD. On social, on, on political reform. Um, when you say political reform, you're talking about uh, what kinds of issues? It. Um, actually, yeah, just pure political reform, electoral reform. Electoral like reform. Yeah. Uh, and, and Pemex and, and things of that sort. Okay. Yeah. So Pemex um, is not a right-left issue for you? It doesn't, it's not in the, for me it is, but not in Congress. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, not the free. Not in the free, yeah. Um, that's a north-south issue, yeah. Um, and we'll see it right here. We'll, go, we'll jump through these really quick. This is actually the, the, um, the dividing line there is the vote is, is at one vote. Each of these is actually a vote. Um, these, every single vote actually cuts through this in every legislature. I'm not showing you all of them. Um, this is one vote, and this was actually the most famous vote in the Fox years, um, which, no, in the, uh, yeah, Fox years, which was going to um, raise the um, EVA. And um, the Elvistas um, and the Verdes voted together with the PAN, uh, and everyone else voted against. To and they just value, barely made it to the value added tax, which was a very important um, reform that wasn't passed. Um, we'll go through here. This I call the, it was not passed. No, this is back in um, 2000, Fox. yeah, so during Fox, yeah. Calderon, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, this is 2000, late 2003, or 2000, yeah, 2003. This is December 2003 for the ejercicio fiscal de 2004. And so. Um, our, our team um, calls this the filet of pre because it split the pre right down up north south, which is really funny. Um, this is the, f the 60th legislature. This is the first one of Calderon. Um, and here, actually, does this have a thing on it? No, this doesn't have that. Yeah, okay. The um, Pemex reforms actually split right down here. There's a line that kind of went down this way. Um, which included these people right here, which are the um, AMLO members of the PRD, plus the PT and Comerhense, which were working with AMLO. Um, and so the Pemex reform went like this way. Hmm. And then the political reforms kind of went down this way. Um, this is the 2011 political reform, because it, um, the small parties didn't like it. Um, for a number of reasons. And so, um, so in many ways, the, the political reforms and the Pemex reform actually has a strong second dimension. It's, it's a diagonal thing, at least, in this case. Um, in that reform, most of the PRI was voting, voting with, um, with a pawn on that. But of course, it was a very weak reform. Um, this is the 61st legislature, which blew up on us. Um, my... Um, my assistant, when he was running this, I'm, I think he has powder burns right now on his fingers um, because of some, some problems of, um, in the database. But um, a lot of this has to do with indiscipline that was happening. And so things all blew up. This is the previous legislature, the one that, we, that just finished right now. And, um, but we don't have um, good graphs on this yet. I'll just jump through this. For discipline, um, the way I measure discipline is, you know, what's the largest proportion of people voting in the same direction in any party? Um, and I'm only looking at, at votes in which one of the big three parties voted against. We can see here, though, the main thing to look at is actually the first, the very first number up there is 99.6. When the PRI had close to majority, and back in the years when they did have a majority in Congress, their discipline was um, just trivially off of 100%. Um, it was, it was most of the time it was 100%. Um, the other parties were at 92, 93, which is kind of typical for everybody um, on many, many other years. As soon as they lost the majority, though, in 2000, um, this is the first year of Fox, and this is, this, this is the first half of Fox, this is the second half of Fox. Predisciplined goes down, and once the Panistas figured out they actually had the presidency, then their discipline goes way up to 98%, and it stayed there for the first years of Calderon as well. And then um, during the last several years, pre-discipline has gone up to 95%. This is, these are very high numbers. I mean, much, much higher than you see in the United States. Um, PRD had a bad year. Um, and this had to do with the divisions, again, between the different tribes of the PRD and so forth. 
Um, the question is, is the PRI going to go back? Now that they have numbers that look like this, and they're going to have the presidency right here in the 62nd legislature, are they going to end up with numbers like this? Um, it's very likely. I don't see any reason why this wouldn't happen. Um, this would be my, my biggest, you know, very strong expectation. They should act like they did before, and they should act like the Pond did most of the time that they had the presidency. And so we're going to see very high discipline among the priestess. The question is, we're going to see high turnout. And um, priestess have lots of other things to do, and they don't show up in Congress very much. Um, the other parties um, sometimes do better. And so that's going to make a very big difference when you're talking about, you know, um, a they have 241 seats with the Verdes, who are their strong coalition partners and almost never vote against them. Um, they have the um, PANAL, which is the teachers' party, um, which has got 10 seats. With that, they get 251. Um, they're going to need those votes all the time. They're going to have to ne renegotiate votes with the teachers' union every single time they have a very close vote. The teachers are going to be in beautiful shape. You know, no um, evaluations, no, um, you know, all the reforms that we've been looking at are going to go out the window because they need these 10 votes, um, unless the other ones give them a better deal. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how that, that develops over the, over the years. Um, the coalitions in the Senate, um, this is only for the last um, six years. Um, and it's been, again, uh, if you look at the first three years of, um, this is the same, they're actually the same senators, so they divide into legislatures. Um, the first part of Calderon, the PRI and the PAN were voting together very, very closely. Um, this is reflecting now an important division in the PRI. The um, leader of the PRI in um, the Senate during all these years was Manlio Fabio Beltrones, who was um, allied in the past with, um, with against the Maestra and with other, other groups in the PRI that were in power at the time. But since um, some point in the last six years has distanced himself from um, Peña Nieto, he was a candidate against Peña Nieto um, early on when, before the PRI defined their candidate. Um, wasn't a very strong candidate against them, but he was, but he was important. And he decided, um, as opposed to the um, strategy that he had actually implemented in the Chamber of Deputies um, in the last years of Fox, which was obstruction, you know, trying to stop the president, he decided once he got to the Senate that, well, he got to kind of act like a prime minister and, um, and kind of, you know, govern, you know, the majorities through Congress um, with a president who didn't have a majority. And so he um, actually worked very closely with um, the PAN in order to get the, the uh, um, president's agenda passed and a lot of his own agenda passed, um, which was partially a pre-agenda and mostly was a Manlio agenda. Um, so this guy has been in the Senate during all these years. And the last, most of the, um, the years in the Chamber of Deputies was a different faction. That would be the faction that turned into the Peña faction. Um, but since there's no re-election in Mexico to the same chamber, people have to switch. And so Manlio is now in the Chamber of Deputies, governing, leading the coalition, leading the, the, the um, party group of the PRI, which is mostly made up of people who belong to Peña. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how this, this develops over the next few years. And we have no idea. But anyway, you can see here that there's very close um, relationships with, uh, with the PAN. Um, and in general, we see you know, pretty good levels on, with the other parties. Um, this is the Senate for both, ch both of the legislatures together. The PAN, again, is on the right. Um, the PRI is actually very far to the right, much further than they are on the Chamber of Deputies. That's because of Manlio. Manlio is working with the PAN here. Um, and um, this is the first half um, of the legislature of the six years, the first three years. Again, they're very, very close. Um, and he can see very clearly the division here with the small parties down here. This is all based on the Pemex reform, which goes this way, and the electoral reform, which goes this way. Um, and uh, then in the 61st legislature, the, P the PRD blows up. <laughs> Um, that's because of different, you know, different factions going on. The PRD is all over the place. 
um, the pre concentrates itself way up on on one edge up there, um, and uh, and but still relatively for pretty far to the right, looking only on the left right dimension. Um, and this is the discipline, which is very, very high for the pond, especially in the first year. Um, but it's also been very high for the pre. And the pre with Manlio had a very, um, very, very cohesive group. This is going to be more difficult for him now because he has the same position, but with people who are not loyal to him in the Chamber of Deputies. Um, and so we'll get to that one later on. So anyway, um, what the big question is really, um, what's going to happen with these reforms? We've been saying that I mean, a lot of people were expecting that Peña Nieto would win the election and he'd win with majorities in Congress. And so all the, ref the structural reforms that we haven't seen for the last 12 years or 15 years um, will now come about. We haven't seen, you know, um, according to many, dramatic reforms in, you know, since the pre had majorities. That's not really true. I mean, we had a lot of major, major reforms in this period, but such as transparency and things like that. But, you know, there's, there hasn't been um, a major, a sufficiently important um, energy reform, labor reform, and so forth. Um, there have been four areas that um, there has been speculation of major reforms coming up. One is the labor reform. Um, another is just general political reform, energy reform, and fiscal reform. And there's others, but these are the, the main ones that, I'm, that um, we've been interested in. There was a political reform that took place last year um, that, or actually this year, um, that was, a, was very partial. It was, part of it was going to introduce re-election and be a major, I mean, a, a fundamental political reform. The pre rejected that. Um, in the chamber deputies, they were in favor of it, mostly in the Senate. But the Pena faction stopped it, so they didn't want to have re-election. Um, if there's, without re-election, um, the deputies don't have any place to go afterwards, and so they become more dependent on the party leadership, which could be, which could mean that they're more dependent on the president. And um, when we do have, you know, if there were re-election, they would have their own political careers in the chambers, which could actually increase their autonomy a little bit. The um, the part that was passed, though, um, included some things on um, on initiatives and referenda and things like that, but also an important thing called the Iniciativa Preferente, which means a kind of preferential bill, um, which allows the president to submit a bill to Congress at the beginning of the session, um, and Congress, the, the chamber that receives it, must act on it within the first 30 days. Um, and this is to, and they can vote against it if they want to, but it, it forces them to make a decision. The presidents have been um, frustrated or, or it gets, is that, actually the or else is not very, very clear, but, um, <laughs> but it, it's, the implication is that it gets, that it can be passed then. That it, it is yeah. passed, if they, don't, if they don't act on it, it, yeah. sh it should go into effect. It should go into Correct. effect to some, to some degree, yeah. Um, and uh, although it's not quite clear. I mean, is the, the, the phrasing isn't, isn't very well written. Yeah. The what? Yeah, no, it's not yeah. clear. Yeah. Um, that was the intention. That was the intention, yeah. Um, the, the, of course, the first one, the first president that gets to use this is Calderon with a legislature that was elected back in July. Um, and so he gets one shot at this. Um, this is something he's been pushing for, for for most of his term. Um, and he did, he sent two bills. One of them was to um, increase the um, fiscal account of, financial accountability of the states and the municipalities, um, particularly in questions of debt, where it's been most important. And the other one was the labor reform that he's been presenting, you know, the, the typical pond labor reform, and the PRI actually had their own labor reform that came in back in um, several years ago, um, which had been blocked somehow. Um, and so the president, the what? Labor reform is to, um, the full effects aren't, aren't totally clear either, but um, one of the ideas is to make it easier to, um, to hire and fire people and cheaper to hire and fire people. Um, there's been questions of, yeah, one of the labor reforms, one version of labor reform has greater union democracy. 
Um, the pre's version usually doesn't include that. Um, and, uh, and a lot of other, other things. Um, the, the labor reform was almost passed. I mean, there's been several moments when it looked like it would be passed within the next month um, over the last um, five years or so. Um, and suddenly it gets gobbed up. Um, and the last time it, it got stuck was actually a pre's re own reform um, that got stopped up by the, um, evidently by, by Peña's people um, who were worried that even though it had the approval of the CTM and the major, major, major unions in, in, within the pre, um, and it had the, um, the support of business and it had the votes of the pod, um, the PRD would be voting against it, but it didn't matter. It was going to be symbolic, and a lot of them were actually in favor of it. Um, and they would have voted for it had there been more union democracy. But it got stopped because there were small pieces of the PRI that were opposed. And Peña didn't want to um, divide the PRI before the election. And so it got, that's the rumors of how this got stopped up last time. And uh, so the question is, um, you know, what's going to happen now? Um, so Calderon kind of called them on it. You know, he's been calling, he's been, Peña was campaigning in favor of labor reform all these years, I mean, for the last several months, and is now um, going to, his own party is going to be forced to make a up or down vote on um, the PANS reform, uh, with amendments if they want to, um, within the next 30 days. And so it was kind of, you know, you campaign on this, let's see if you can actually get it passed through your people before you become president. Um, and then maybe it'll be easier to do this before he becomes president because then he doesn't get the blame for it. But again, it's going to be hard to see if, if Peña is going to allow his, his, um, the priest that is in Congress to divide, even if, you know, only, you know, three quarters, one quarter, if he's going to let them divide before he becomes president. Because if he does, it might be, that might be a sign that he's lost control that he can't actually force his people to vote all in favor of, of one, one thing. And so it's going to be very, very difficult for this thing to, to get past. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, the next 30 days are going to be fascinating. Um, one inconvenience, actually, to doing the Iniciativa Preferente at the beginning of a term is that there's no committees. And there's no committees for the first six weeks or so, because it takes them forever to kind of negotiate them. This time, though, they actually got together. Um, and today, they're setting up the committee. Um, they probably already have uh, for the, the Labor Committee, which is the only committee that's in existence right now. The others are going to come out at the, you know, in October at some point, probably middle of October. Um, but this one has already been created in order to, to deal with this particular reform. Um, I don't know what they did with the other reform. That has to go to committee, too. but. But the, I, I'm sure the pre will vote against um, financial accountability for the states. Um, they're depending on this in order to keep the states backing them in the future. Um, there's uh, other questions like of energy reform, um, where there was, he had been campaigning, Pena had been campaigning um, for opening up the sector to more private investment. Um, the same thing we've already heard of. We already have a, a the reform that took place several years ago, which did a lot of this. It's the beginning of the, um, of the Calderon years. Um, after many years of Fox trying to change it, Calderon got something done on this. But, um, and it changed the law, but it didn't change the Constitution. And a lot of people kind of agree that the law works, except that it has no constitutional basis. And so as soon as the Supreme Court says that this is unconstitutional, which they could do at any time, then the whole system collapses. And so everyone agrees that probably we should have a constitutional reform in order to allow um, explicitly more private investment. Um, the priest, uh, he avoided talking about this during the campaign, that there would be a constitutional reform. He just kept on talking about continuing to open it up for private investment. Um, priests are very wary of um, opening this up to constitutional reform, though, at all. I don't think they will touch the Constitution. And so um, despite all the talk about this, I really strongly doubt we'll see something there. Um, and um, there's, we can talk later about the political reform and fiscal reform. Um, I don't, fiscal reform, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing what they come up with. And so, so I'd be happy to see your questions. All right. So. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to very quickly um, throw out one question for you, which has to do with the PRD. Yeah. Uh, the PRD, in many ways, is the big winner in the legislature. It gained uh, the largest percentage of seats uh, year over year for itself. 
uh, compared to the other uh, two parties. Yeah. It made the, lo the biggest gain uh, in terms of its, its uh, uh, share within the legislature. Um, and the PRD has been, at least according to the data that you presented here, fairly cohesive, uh, compared to, uh, surprisingly cohesive for a party that's not in power. Um, um, if you go back to uh, about, where were you talking about? Cohesion's right here. PRD, uh, overall cohesiveness, yeah. right? I mean, you look at the discipline of the, of the PRD, and while pre-discipline discipline falls, uh -huh. When they go out of power, and pan uh, or pan uh, discipline rises when they get in power, um, we see the PRD actually remaining fairly constant. There's a slight dip at the end. Um, this is a party that I don't think is 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 widely regarded for its cohesiveness and unity, and yet it votes a straight block. Um, what can we expect from the PRD in terms of its ability to maintain cohesiveness in the next legislature, particularly considering that, as you pointed out, there are very significant and different factions within the PRD. There is this possibility of a wandering profit mentality on the part of uh, uh, Lopez Obrador, possibly going off to some other party at some point, uh, if Federico's uh, prediction is correct. Will this party be able to use its greater numbers and past cohesiveness as a way of positioning itself either for the midterm or next elections? Will it be able to use its block of votes in a way that will help advance its policy goals? What do you think about basically yeah. the PRD's position in this legislature? Okay, you can see there that the first, the first two legislatures, the last one of, um, the last one of um, Cedillo and the first one of Fox, it was kind of low, it was lower, it was about the same as the pine. And then it jumps up here um, to a pretty high level. This is actually because they knew that they could win. Mm -hmm. this, this was because they were looking at Lopez Obrador as their candidate, mm -hmm. and they got really excited. And they said, this is, this is it, we can now do it. You know, we can now take power right here. And so um, we saw very, very cohesive. There's a s relatively small group of uh, periodistas, um, but they, um, they were very, very well organized. And that continued in the first three years of the election because those are mostly um, Lopez Obrador's people who got elected at that time. Um, it went way down afterwards because this is when Lopez Obrador got punished you know, for the, all the things, all the protests. People realized, you know, that they didn't, weren't so sure about this party, and that allowed and the other factions to the the come well. in. Yeah. Now again, I would expect that um, since everyone was very happy with this return, with the with the returns of this last election, that they and they still see Lopez Obrador as a leader, that could um, continue to be high. Um, but for this to be high, we have to um, actually believe that he's not just a prophet that he's going to be the candidate, and which is what I believe. Or that I mean, there's yeah, a winning candidate yeah, yeah. out there that could take his place. I, yeah, I don't think there is. No? Uh, no, I think, I mean, um, Ebrard is very, very popular in the DF, and the candidate who replaced him won by a huge margin. Um, you asked earlier about, someone asked earlier about women, I think it was. Women. Yeah. I think one of the things to recognize in the DF election, um, the candidate, the PRD candidate was the only male candidate and ran against three women. And so despite the hopes that we all had that this was a good test this year of seeing, you know, whether or not Women's Mexicans vote. were subconsciously sexist, mm -hmm. the, um, the evidence in the DF, um, you know, could mean that either that or also there were three women who were very, very bad candidates, which is also mostly mm -hmm. the case. Um, but anyway, the question is whether or not a bard can be a, can uh, a candidate and a leader. Um, he wouldn't be the leader of this particular group, I don't think. Um, and uh, the question is whether Ebrard, with his record in the DF, can win outside the DF. Um, and uh, especially if there's focus on questions of gay marriage and abortion, um, which sell well in the DF, that's not going to sell well, you know, 50 miles outside the DF. 
And so I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not so sure about Everard's possibilities. And my guess is that AMLO is going to continue to think he's going to be the candidate in, two, in 2018, whether it's reasonable or not. Um, but that could be good for the party. It could actually increase party unity as you know, they have this leader that they could be following. But it would also repeat the pattern, the better than us pattern. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's you know, three times, three times each. <laughs> the Cardinals yeah. had just gone through that fourth try. Right. Try to pull a Lula. Any um, other questions uh, for what's going to happen in Mexico's next legislature, David Gaddis Smith? Yeah. So you said with Pinal they could get a majority. What good is that without having the Senate? Because you can't get that majority in the Senate. No. What good is it? Not very much. Um, but you do get something passed to the Chamber of Deputies. And you can get the budget passed. The budget does not go to budget. the Senate, which is very important. And, um, and that's one of the things that tends to divide most closely, is when we have some of the closest votes, it tends to be on the budget. Good. Much more than on public policy. Yeah. Teachers, yeah. yeah. They can eat. That's, and it's very easy to parse out money that way. Their salaries will not be in, je in jeopardy. Not at all, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and uh, the question is whether they're going to use they're going to use them on other issues. Um, it, it's useless to use, you know, this coalition is only good for um, changing laws, not the Constitution. Um, a lot of things will require constitu constitutional changes, and it's going to be hard for, for example, for major electoral reform, that the one that um, Peña wants to do to um, reduce the number of um, proportional representation seats. Um, that's not going to be easy to pass if the PON and the, um, and the PRD um, figure out what's best for them and, and don't do that. Um, so, because you, you can't do it with, with just this coalition. They're going to need more than that. That, that said, the, the major pending reforms that you've indicated are all things that Calderon wanted to do himself, yeah. that Fox wanted to do himself. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you think about the, the legislative coalitions that you've uh, described in the past, which have been predominantly pre-PAN, um, is it really, uh, why wouldn't Peña Nieto simply take all the reforms that Calderon and Fox uh, tried to get passed, and which the pre voted against in some cases, and say, "Look, let's do these now uh, that we're in the uh, in Los Pinos, and 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 get labor, fiscal, energy reform uh, accomplished at least at some measure." What's the you your seem your your assumption seems to be that the somehow the PAN won't go for elect no, for, for the reforms that they wanted or, or that they, they won't be enough? Actually, one of my big, the biggest question is whether or not they're sincere about the reforms. Um, the, the question in the past, for the last 12 years, did these reforms not get passed because the PRI was trying to block PAN presidents or because they were ideologically opposed to this? Um, the campaign was based on the assumption that we're not ideologically opposed to these things. Um, now is the big test. Is it, is it one or the other, and we're going to really see um, you know, strong reforms um, offered, or are they going to be you know, more of the little incremental reforms we've seen in the past, which might not be a bad thing, but, it's, but that's, that's what we're going to be really looking at here. Great. Uh, unless there are any pressing questions, I'm going to suggest that we take another five-minute break. We'll let um, Emily Edmonds get uh, her uh, notes prepared, and then we'll start uh, sharply at 10, 11, 10. Um, we will have about 50 minutes for a final discussion of U.S.-Mexico relations under the new uh, governing arrangements that we've been talking about this morning. So uh, be prepared with your questions about what this means for us, in particular on this side of the border and uh, the uh, policy interests of the United States and Mexico. So thank you. My senior colleague in the Department of Political Science, uh, Dr. Emily Edmonds. My co-author on the, uh, the book, Contemporary Mexican Politics. Um, what we haven't told you is that this entire session has been orchestrated to enable us to plan the third edition of the book when we will have to build in all of this new information about Mexico's election. Uh, this is our opportunity to, to gain the, the latest information and the highest wisdom 
on what's happening in Mexico today. Uh, but to help fill in some of that information, uh, I've asked uh, uh, Dr. Edmonds to please give us an overview of the U.S.-Mexico relationship, uh, where it stands in general, and also what specifically it um, uh, means for uh, the United States and Mexico to see the results of the most recent election. The only thing I'll add is that, as you well know, uh, we are in the middle of a presidential election cycle, our, uh, well, uh, uh, almost at the end of a presidential election cycle ourselves here in the United States. Every 12 years, U.S. and Mexican uh, presidential elections coincide in the same year. And so it will be interesting to see what happens, assuming there's uh, change or even if there's not, uh, in the next administration, uh, whether it's the Peña Nieto Obama administration or the Peña Nieto uh, uh, Romney, that's the guy, uh, the, uh, uh, administration, we will see uh, uh, undoubtedly s some very important interactions between both governments. So uh, to help us understand what those might be, uh, Emily Edmonds. Thank you. Um, I want to apologize. I don't have any slides, um, in part because I was actually instructed not to make any slides. So what that means is that either She's the I'm the only one who followed panelist. directions or I'm the only one who was negligent. I don't know. Um, You're just the only one who got the instructions. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, there's that possibility. Um, OK. Well. From the U.S. perspective, I think yeah, the, tw the 2012 election was very interesting. Uh, the Mexican 2012 election was very interesting. Um, and uh, in part because I think unlike at least the previous two elections, um, the United States didn't have a, a clear, if sort of unstated, preference in who won the election. Um, but, and I think that there was a certain amount of resignation about the fact that Peña Nieto was sort of slated to win, if not by the margins that were predicted by the polls, um, at least um, pretty decisively. Um, and, and this sort of resignation, I think, was accompanied by uh, a certain amount of concern. Um, of course, Mexico, or excuse me, the United States has a, a vested interest in having a stable and democratic uh, neighbor next door, and when it was seen that Peña Nieto seemed to be kind of behaving in the manner of old-styled priistas by doing things like, um, you know, building high-profile public works in important electoral areas, um, uh, buying or negotiating favorable and disproportionate media coverage um, and evidently votes of, you know, the, these types of things that were just investigated by the IFE. Uh, this, this was some cause for concern, um, I think, and, and reinforced the, the concerns that Peña Nieto might not be a trustworthy ally on the top kind of bilateral issues that, that always preoccupy the United States and Mexico. Um, of course, trade, migration, and security slash um, drug issues. Um, and I think that, that this, this concern came, um, I, I, I wouldn't say necessarily that it was new, but you know, if we look back at what happened between the United States and the Calderon administration, um, there were definitely some big snags um, over the course of uh, the past sexennio. Um, you know, to, to name but a few, uh, you know, sort of the, in trade, perhaps the ongoing dispute um, about, you know, tuna, for example, right, that still um, has, yet, has, has actually gone to, forward to the WTO. Uh, the WikiLeaks scandal involving Ambassador Pascual, um, in which, you know, diplomatic cables revealed that um, he expressed concerns about the, quote, risk-averse nature of the Army and other security forces. Um, there were ruffled feathers about uh, high-level U.S. officials um, talking about Mexico as a potential failed state, uh, the narco-trafficking as a potential insurgency, um, and, of course, most seriously, the attacks on U.S. citizens, um, the, the consular officials in Ciudad Juarez, the ICE agents, the most recently, of course, the CIA agents um, outside of Mexico City. So th there were some definite low points, right, um, over the past six years. Um, but I think it's 
if, if we focus too much on these, that they tend to overshadow really the fact that um, by, by s many measures, actually, the relationship between the United States and Mexico was probably uh, the strongest it's ever been um, uh, during the Calderon administration. Um, and we can look again at different, at different measures, you know, in, in these different kinds of categories of, you know, if we look at trade, um, you know, the, the United States and Mexico continue to be um, among each other's, you know, top three um, trading partners, right, D that uh, exports, U.S. exports to Mexico are approaching $200 billion a year. Um, this is up 20% from 2010 and 77% from 2000. So, um, you know, clearly growing very dramatically in that time period. Um, and, and perhaps also I think sometimes people forget that, I mean, the United States imports more from Mexico, right, than, than it actually exports. That's over $200 billion a year, at least last year. Um, so there, there's, there's that very vibrant trading relationship. There were some, you know, for all of the, the snags like the tuna, there were successes like finally the resolution of the trucking dispute, right, of the allowing Mexican trucks to um, haul cargo into the United States. Um, the, the retaliatory tariffs, right, that, that Mexico had introduced. Um, that seems to have been resolved. Um, on, on the issue of migration, you know, we still, of course, have not seen the passage of the DREAM Act or anything even closely resembling uh, comprehensive immigration reform, but the most recent um, order by the president to allowing um, particularly children, right, um, who were brought by their parents uh, to, to the United States illegally to, to stay at least or to temporarily avoid being deported, right, that, um, this is clearly a step in the right direction from Mexico's perspective. Um, so, so there, there's been some movement on that, and certainly uh, much more movement than had been the case um, under Fox uh, and and Bush, for whom presumably that was a priority. Um, and then even on security and the issues of security, uh, there was more and deeper uh, coordinated kind of joint efforts to deal with. Uh, various security issues, most prominently, of course, um, the, the problems associated with narco-trafficking. Um, you have the establishment of the, the bio, the fusion center that's supposed to bring together uh, personnel from Mexican and U.S. security agencies to work together and, and, and um, address these problems in a, in a cooperative fashion. Uh, perhaps even more significantly would be what I think now, I don't know, I don't, David, you might know the exact number. Uh, the the uh, several hundred, I think, now extraditions um, that have taken place, bet uh, you know, Mexican citizens that have been extradited to the United States to face <coughs> charges on, in most cases, you know, some, some form of of uh, charges uh, associated with drug with drug trafficking. Um, you know, again, most recent example here would be the um, Eduardo Arellano Felix, right, which was just what last week. Um, or this was earlier this week. Earlier this weekend, um, the numbers around uh, 100 a year on average yeah. in terms of extraditions, which is, is has have been record levels. Yeah. Um, so you know the the question is, will the election of of Enrique Peña Nieto change? I mean, which which way can it, will it go? Will it sort of lead to a situation where there are more of these? Um, pitfalls and misunderstandings and um, examples of lack of coordination and mistrust or distrust? Um, or will they be able to build on uh, this more cooperative, uh, you know, kind of symbiotic relationship that really has characterized much of the last uh, sexennial? And I think looking forward, of course, you know, given that we're in our own um, election season, we have to consider various possibilities. Um, if, we, if we, for a moment, um, assume that uh, President Obama is reelected, that might give us one scenario. Um, I mean, Mexico, I think, from, certainly from the Mexican perspective, has never been as high a priority to the Obama administration as it believes it should be. Um, and I, so far, I think from what we've seen, 
um, it's, it's not clear that that will necessarily change, at least not to Mexico's satisfaction. But then again, I'm not sure that <laughs> that that's possible to ever Mexico to ever be completely satisfied with the amount or quality of attention it's getting from the United States. Um, so while um, you know Mexico might not um, shoot up to number one prior, you know sort of foreign policy priority for an Obama a second Obama administration, uh, there are I think um, some you know clearly the, Mexico is very important to the United States and there are some areas where we could expect to see continued cooperation. Um, again, if we kind of return to this theme of, of you know, thinking about trade, migration, and, and security. Uh, the Obama administration appears pretty committed at this point to um, what's being called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right, which is a, a free trade agreement, a kind of, quote, high standards um, free trade agreement that is, that would bring together 10 countries and, you know, Asian and Pacific countries, including Mexico. Um, and what it would mean for the bilateral relationship is that it could potentially, um, I mean, some of the, sometimes the word that's used is upgrade NAFTA. Um, and by that, what, what we're talking about would be revised and higher standards in the areas of labor and the environment, intellectual property rights protections. Um, but also further reduction in tariff, in, in, in um, trade barriers in areas like agriculture, right, which we know have been um, real sticking points to, to deepening the integration between the two economies. Um, I think that from Mexico's perspective, initially when the, the, the TPP was started and, you know, gotten off the ground and everything, Mexico was not a part of those negotiations. Uh, it is now, uh, I guess maybe they're involved in the next round. I think they have not yet participated in negotiations, but from here on forward, both Mexico and Canada will be. And I think this is very good news for Mexico because you certainly don't want your most important trading partner negotiating new free trade agreements with um, other people across the world who could potentially pose um, uh, some pretty... Uh, you know, important competition to you. So now Mexico has been brought to the table, and I think, um, at least if we believe Peña Nieto's rhetoric, um, you know, he is very committed to continuing this idea of free trade and, and um, you know, building on NAFTA, frankly, I think. Um, and I think, you know, to the extent that, that uh, you know, free trade is is here to stay, and you know, being part of a regional agreement like this is going to be certainly much better for Mexico than than being excluded from it. Um, so this is this is potentially an area where um, where we might see the countries work uh, together or jointly with others um, to make progress. In the area of migration, um, you know, I think much of this, much of whether. The administration is willing to move forward on further immigration reform is going to depend very much on what happens in um, the U.S. congressional elections. Um, if if it's if the the Democrats, you know, don't win a majority, um, you know, don't it's basically don't improve their standing from from what it is now. Um, it, it may be that Obama doesn't want to spend any more political capital on the issue of migration. Um, he may be, you know, investing his energy elsewhere. Um, I think that could potentially change, however, if there's a Congress that's more favorable to the idea of comprehensive immigration reform. Um, this, of course, would not involve Mexico directly, in the, especially since Washington has, even though immigration is clearly, or migration is clearly an international phenomenon, Washington, I think, has always seen immigration, U.S. immigration policy as a national issue rather than an intermessic sort of issue. So, um, nevertheless, I think the Peña Nieto um, administration would benefit from some sort of immigration reform Right, and would capitalize on um, on anything that would happen in the United States that might uh, sort of facilitate the flow of people across the border. Um, in the area of security, um, so far the Obama administration has um, 
supported certainly the, the Merida initiative um, and has supplemented that with um, pretty significant, I mean, well, I mean, not, I don't know, it's, I think it is significant um, additional funding for addressing, um, you know, the dr various aspects of the, um, the war on drugs. Um, and I think this is something that, uh, I mean, could potentially be a point of, of leverage for the administration over Peña Nieto if it is perceived that he is, is lax on addressing the problem, if there's, you know, rampant corruption within the administration, if there's a lack of political will to continue um, Calderón's policies in some form, uh, you know, the, the administration could withhold that additional funding. Um, so now, I don't know that there's necessarily any indication that Peña Nieto is going to change course or significantly change course, but um, that's something I think that U.S. officials are um, very open to, you know, holding over Mexico's head, right, if they need to. Um, the... Um, if if um, Governor Romney wins the election, we could face um, a, a very uh, maybe in terms of actual policy um, initiatives or pol or or um, approaches. I think the substance of the many of them would be somewhat similar to the Obama administration. I don't see any huge differences, but the but the rhetoric surrounding them, I think. Is, pot is potentially going to be very different. Um, the the Rom a, the Romney, I guess what campaign organization right or campaign has um, been been very clear I think about what his goals are with the region. I mean he's he's identified Latin America as a very important area where the United States needs to strengthen its partnerships, um, particularly economic partnerships. Um, he's he's talking he talks about this campaign for economic opportunity in Latin America, um, which is designed to promote free trade, free enterprise, um, support democracy. Some of this is, um, I think, his effort, effort to uh, criticize the Obama administration and saying that it has not been uh, effective enough at countering the influence of people like Hugo Chavez um, and his kind of retinue within Latin America. And then he claims that he would use this campaign to be to uh, more actively try to counteract that. Um, and his, his eventual goal is to create what he calls a, um, a Reagan economic zone. Uh, now, this is supposed to go beyond <laughs> the borders of Latin America, this is, this is thought to be uh, more than just a regional phenomenon, but I think the choice of the name, um, it makes perfect sense from a U.S. perspective where you want to invoke, you know, the, the, the legacy of this hero. Uh, from a Latin American perspective, uh, as many of you know, it's, it's really uh, <laughs> a very poor choice. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, or Nicaragua, or I mean, we can go down the list, right? So, um, I think that this sort of suggests that. Well, I mean, let's. I mean, we, perhaps we should give the guy some credit. You know, he he is not yet president. He he, you know, doesn't have a significant amount of, of foreign policy experience in the way that we would expect a president to have. Perhaps he's unfamiliar with the legacy that Reagan has in Latin America, wow, well, it's very different, you know, from, from that in the United States. Uh, nevertheless, I think part of, um, part, part of what that means is, um, is a more kind of proactive role that he, would, that he intends to play in Latin America, and that has to do both with, with economics, but also with security. Ta he's talking about building this hemispheric, um, hemispheric joint task force on crime and terror, um, he has stated pretty clearly that uh, um, it's uh, well that it's not certainly with um, outside the realm of possibility that the United States military would would play a more active role in the region in combating uh, in addressing issues like drug trafficking and and terrorism. 
Um, on a practical level for Mexico, um, I think what this means is that, I mean, certainly a Romney, a President Romney would not back down on the war on drugs, especially if the perception that it's spilling over the border, whether it actually is or not, is maybe a different question, but uh, is if that perception continues to um, live, then of course he would be under pressure to, to address that. Um, but his, his way of addressing it, at least the, the way that he's stated it so far, um, is again by beefing up or in, increasing um, uh, military training, intelligence sharing, um, you know, these types of things, and completing the border fence, right? So, which, you know, neither of these play well in Mexico. Um, so, the, the, you know, the question then becomes, well, how does Mexico respond to these different kinds of these different presidents, I guess. Um, and I think that, that Peña Nieto is, um, on the one hand, very unlikely to, I mean, I, I think he probably learned a lesson from, from Vicente Fox, right? I mean, he's not gonna come in and claim that whole-scale immigration reform is gonna happen during his sexenio, as if that were somehow under his control. Um, I, and at the same time, I think he will certainly maintain Mexico's position that um, that border fences don't solve the problem, that border patrol agents that use force are, um, you know, violating the human rights of Mexican citizens, and, and the same types of, of rhetoric that we've heard from previous administrations, sort of regardless of what party they're from. Um, I think that, um, as I said earlier, that the, on issues of, of trade and, and economics, that whether he's working with Obama or Romney, they're going to be the greatest uh, possibility for for cooperation and um, and joint action. Um, the issue on the issue of um, of drug trafficking, however, I think um, you know again they'll, he will I'm, I, I, maybe not himself, but certainly let allow his party to raise the issue, continue to raise the issues of you know illegal arms trafficking into Mexico, mon money laundering. Um, the U.S. demand for drugs, right? All of these types of, of contributing factors to the Mexican war on drugs that, that he wants the United States to um, address more, um, more comprehensively. Um, but, you know, Peña Nieto can't really push too hard on those issues. And in this sense, he's not any different from, from Felipe Calderón or really any other Mexican president, again, regardless of what party they come from. Uh, because any m administration that seeks to maintain uh, the the momentum, uh, you know, this kind of militarized strategy um, to address the war on drugs is going to need the United States' help. They're going to need help with the funding. They're going to need help with the intelligence. They're going to need help with the equipment. And so the more the pushback uh, a Peña Nieto administration or any, you know, gives the United States, uh, the more likely he is potentially to, to jeopardize that. So I guess perhaps to echo Federico's um, initial conclusions, um, I don't see any, any really dramatic changes on the immediate horizon. I mean, I think that um, that doesn't mean there won't be spats and disagreements and dust-ups. I mean, the two countries have way too much history to be that optimistic. But I think... Um, we will, in 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 many ways, um, see more of more of the same, more of the kind of thing that we saw we've seen over the past six years. Um, one of the things that you touched on, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, you laid out a, a rationale for Mexico that suggested that uh, Mexico should do it, uh, or Mexico wants to do it mainly not to get cut out of the deal, which was in part the logic of NAFTA. Uh, the United States and uh, Canada signed an agreement uh, four or five years before uh, NAFTA. Uh, Mexico uh, and the United States then began to negotiate a separate deal. Canada said, wait, 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 we don't want to be left out of that. Let's just make it a North American uh, uh, program. Do you see any uh, specific advantages that Mexico will gain 
through the TPP? Uh, are there other reasons than the strategic logic of not being excluded? Um, are there benefits that they might hope to gain? And what are the risks and liabilities that you see in entering that uh, new agreement? Well, I think that um, the there are, there are some some real benefits to to Mexico um, it, in that you know Mexico's biggest economic liability probably well maybe not biggest but one of the biggest is is how important the U.S. market is right right as, or the U.S. is as a trading partner and to the extent that Mexico can diversify its um, um, its economy and, and its trading partners, which this agreement might allow it to do, um, that that would that is clearly going to be beneficial to Mexico, right? I think it was it's also beneficial if if within this if I mean part of the rationale for the agreement more generally, and I think for everybody who's involved, is of course as a counterweight to China. So I think that it Mexico also benefits from that as well. Um, in in terms of Liabilities, I think that it, it's, I mean, many of them are the standard kind of liabilities that come with free trading regimes to begin with, right? Um, and, but it seems that Mexico, like many other countries in the region and in the world for that matter, have, um, have sort of, you know, the costs of being left out of free trade regimes are much, much higher than um, then being in them and then trying, you know, try, sort of trying to deal with the problems as they, as they arise. Um, so I think that, uh, I mean, I think in, in general it's, you know, Mexico, the, the, the cost benefit calculation that, that Mexico has made is probably the right one, that it needs to be a part of this and that in the, and on balance it's going to benefit more than it's going to, um, that it's going to lose. Other questions, comments? A question that weaves its way through an awful lot of your discussions, and it relates to the effects of organized criminal activity on one hand, in terms of the, the government's capacity to fulfill some pretty fundamental aspects of governance, as well as on the other hand, the erosion of public confidence and trust in the government itself because of its inability to contain and control these problems and to provide for for citizen security. And I don't even know who to direct the question to, so remember. Is is the question, the question yeah, yeah, is the question has have these things eroded or uh, I guess I'm really trying to get a better sense of how how deeply the criminal activity and the violence that's associated with it you know, on one hand, you get the intimidation, coercion, abduction, torture, murder of police, prosecutors, judges, state officials. You get also manipulation of the political system, bankrolling elections, assassinating political candidates, elected leaders. How this has all come together over the last six years, and just, you know, more your opinion than anything else about what are, what are its effects on the political process. Right. Federico, Federico also wanted to jump in with a, a comment. I yeah, but, but let me just answer that uh, first, or part of that, because I can't answer it all, but uh, as it relates to to uh, some of the things uh, Emily said, um, um, it's uh, clear that there, uh, you know, we have a broad range of, uh, say, um, kind of political facts on the ground related uh, uh, to uh, drugs and, uh, and, and the mafias. Um, so Tamaulipas appears to be our Somalia, uh, pretty much. I mean, that's Somalia. And uh, you cross and you, you, know, you have different uh, gradations of control uh, from the state authorities or local authorities as well as national. I mean, you have you, you do have federal forces operating in, uh, in all these zones across the across the country, depending on the most recent level uh, or peaks of violence. Okay, not not usually responding to drug uh, 
um, uh, figures, that is to uh, the amount of trade or the amount, the flows of drugs uh, and money uh, and even arms uh, with respect to that. But yes, in terms of violence. So you can, you can trace it by tracing uh, army deployments no, in the cities and, 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 on, the, and on the highways. Um, but, um, but, you know, that sort of has a lot to do with that kind of failed state argument of the, I mean, we, you know, you, you, were, you were nice about it, Emily, about, you know, that, that the Hoover Institute uh, uh, clique, uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, Fukuyama and, uh, and, and, uh, and the ambassador, Pasquale, um, um, were, uh, were pushing so heavily, Krasner, my teacher from UCLA, that were, that were pushing so, you know, in, in, uh, in, over the last few years. So there is a problem here. There's another problem, though. Um, this has to do, a lot of that has to do not so much with, uh, let's call it the, uh, well, I would call it the minority uh, share of the drug trade, that is the hard drugs that are imported into Mexico, um, thousands of, uh, of uh, points of entry uh, from the coasts through airports, through uh, you know, drop-off drop off zones of all sorts, very hard to control. Um, uh, though the Navy has been doing a decent job of it on the coasts, uh, it's not perfect, and uh, certainly the customs houses don't help uh, where the Navy cannot enter. Um, airports are a uh, Another uh, question. So this is throughout the country. It's um, uh, I'm a little worried about you know the Romney suggestions uh, that sound they really sound like gunboat diplomacy to me. But um, but I'm not sure that proconsular um, vigilance, Pasquale style, is any better uh, in practice. So I mean it's, it's very difficult um, to know. At the same time, I don't see how the U.S. can back off anything. Um, I mean, it's shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, it, you want to deny us uh, uh, intelligence and uh, certain kinds of special technological resources? Uh, go ahead. Great. Uh, you know how much is entering uh, the country day in, day out. I, I don't think you can afford that, um, un unless that's the, the fight you want to take. But, on, but think of it in a fundamental way. If you look at the domestic side of drug trafficking, by that I mean Mexican production, of marijuana, Mexican production of marijuana. Um, we have, of course, have a historical uh, competitive advantage in that uh, production uh, and in trading, you know, and shipping it to the U.S. Um, since uh, it's been going on for ages, and increasingly, of course, of poppy uh, and opium that's growing uh, strongly um, now. On the west coast, you know, this is the west, the west, the western, the mountains on the western side of the country. Um, what does this respond to? Well, yes, of course it responds to growing U.S. demand, but give me a break. I mean, you know, uh, the ambivalence from the U.S. government is very hard to deal with. Um, your official policy, as it has been for 40 years, as it has been with us, uh, is the Nixon policy uh, with respect to the, a total war on drugs. Uh, and your effective policy is medical marijuana, uh, which I'm sure I can find somewhere nearby here. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, well, you know, the, the, the election is important, too, here. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's 16 states and counting, and, and, um, and, uh, and, and it's a problem um, because they're diametrically opposed policies, obviously, uh, that justify everything and nothing. Uh, and uh, and leave us as confused. Now, in the, in the case of the Calderon government, no, we were talking here about an administration uh, profoundly conservative on drug issues, including marijuana, uh, without uh, w unwilling to give it a second thought. This is a man, after all, born into a um, low-income middle-class family in the south side of Morelia uh, ages ago and, uh, you know, basically almost Cristero values uh, from that part of Michoacan and, and unlikely uh, to, to ever think twice about this issue. However, 
uh, it's different. I mean, it's clearly different on a generation in generational terms, and possibly with other regional splits in the country, and possibly with different generations in the elite. So I, um, so th that may come to change, and uh, it's something that you should expect. It's a, it's very tough. We, you know, we have a very high inertial level of violence in the West due to this, but it's also 40 years of inter of, um, of constant interaction with the army. Uh, and its eradication campaigns that have not been effective, though it takes approximately 40% of the operational army budget to just patrol those fields. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I, I find most of these discussions today uh, much too light and superficial and, and not... Um, not getting at the heart uh, of this issue on the bilateral agenda, and I, I, it remains a problem. It may be that um, big love doesn't include drugs, no? It should Romney win, and, and you may get a very hardline position, very consistent hardline position uh, from the uh, Republican government, more so than you would have gotten from uh, continued Obama administration. But it, it looks very ambivalent to us down south, and uh, 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 without a definition on your part. So it's very hard to respond to. Uh, it's true that drug consumption is growing in the country, but by no means is it anywhere near the levels in the U.S., nor are the rates of growth like those of, of the fastest growing segments of the U.S. drug consuming population. So I'm, uh, I mean, really, you know, um, uh, we have Somalia. Uh, not because of the U.S. Uh, maybe Tamaulipas was always Somalia. You know, it was always a center for contraband uh, in the old days of uh, trade barriers. Um, there was always some of this going on. But the, love and so the level of violence is what's different. And that price tag is just too high uh, to pay. It seems very clear to me that, that there wasn't much of a mandate in this last election, but everyone has agreed on that, um, that we're really sort of unwilling to continue paying that price tag, uh, regardless of how the U.S. looks at it. And I think you will see a change there. So uh, that, uh, it just cannot continue to be, to, continue, you know, to, go on, to be fought in these terms. Uh, in Mexico. The price tag is just too high. Um, and the Calderon government was willing to pay it um, for its reasons. I doubt anyone else would be. But yet there were no, I mean, that's one of the things that was so shocking in a way about this election was that this issue really didn't get a lot of play in the, in the debates and within the campaigns or anything to suggest, I mean, if anything, you know, Peña Nieto has held his new and fascinating ideas very close to the vest, right, on how he's going to, to, so, and it's hard to imagine that it would, that the strategy um, is, is going to, at least the militarized part of the strategy is going to fundamentally change, since that it does remain really popular with Mexican voters, whether it's working or not. Even it, though it contributes <coughs> to the violence, right? I mean, there's that sort of vicious cycle thing that, or um, that starts to happen. Well, I agree. I mean, but again, uh, the part, the reason. Um, uh, a good part of the reason for the increase in violence has to do, of course, with rivalries uh, between gangs, but also uh, with the, let's call it, anchoring of the drug trafficking system uh, in, in, you know, in cities and, and along certain uh, highways. And that becomes costly as they fight over that and as they fight with the army over it. It's still the case, though, that... Um, uh, that uh, uh, it's, all, it's still most of the ones, I'm sorry, uh, uh, has, uh, it's disproportionately related to imported hard drugs and um, insumos, what do you call those? What are insumos? Um, uh, no, insumos for production. There's an English inputs. Inputs, thank you. Yeah, um, and, and inputs, say for uh, for amphetamines or you know whatever they're producing, th these sorts of things uh, that are that are big on you know that are big on the agenda right now. Th those are, um, you know, I find it just difficult to um, uh, to envisage a continued use of the army. Oh, my God, the army hasn't had this much political clout I in Mexican politics since. Well, the Cardenas years, yes, the 30s probably, no? Um, um, and, um, and, and that's quite remarkable. We, we don't 
quite know where that will lead. I mean, you know, this is going over old ground that we thought really we didn't have to cover again. Uh, it's very dangerous uh, uh, what's been occurring in that sense. Uh, it, it's hard to control down the line, possibly. Uh, it's good to have rivalries between the Navy and the Army and others uh, in the meantime, but all of these things, uh, you know, we, we get weakened essentially at, uh, at every point. So to come back to your question originally, it's not just government effectiveness in controlling the ground, it's also a problem with uh, government coordination at the top, as we see in incident after incident uh, in the fights amongst the agencies. Uh, and it's also the potential for something much worse uh, down the line. So, you know, Emily started by talking about how much the U.S. benefited from Mexican stability and democracy. Uh, yeah, but see, the price tag leads us to instability and uh, very authoritarian features inside the political elite. So I'm not, you know, I, I'm not very convinced that this is smart policy uh, thus far from the U.S. In, in terms of how to deal, uh, of how it deals with Mexico, on specifically on the drug issues on uh, on the agenda. Others, I grant, have other ways of. To other, you know, you can look at it different ways, trade and money and the rest of it. But drugs is a bit very tough. And this is the one you've elected to, to uh, you know, to squeeze in. We have unfortunately reached the noon hour. Um, we promised really? to bring the program to a close at noon. Um, but I think that our panelists would be willing to stay a few minutes beyond to chat with you, to answer additional questions and so on, so we can take the discussion offline. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for participating in the roundtable discussion. There is certainly a lot more to say and a lot more to come under uh, the Peña Nieto um, question mark uh, uh, U.S.-Mexico uh, relationship. And we'll find out in November exactly which way things are going to go and hopefully have an opportunity to discuss these issues again. So thanks again for being with us, and, uh, and uh, please feel free to talk to our guests.